people, even if it is virtually. So, right. We'll get back to normal sooner or later, Lord willing. Yeah. Well, the vaccine gets rolling out, then we'll get headed back in the right direction. I, we are making a few more trips than we um, have been doing the whole year, but uh, it's still a lot less than than we do normally, obviously. So, sure. We canceled several vacations this year. Me and my wife just got back from Georgia after an 11-day trip, and she got COVID after we got back. So, uh, oh, nice. She's doing okay though, but still. Well, the only trip I took this year was to Texas to visit my wife's family, and they insisted it's in Texas they don't wear masks, and I dumbly went along with it, and I suffered for ten days because of it. So, <laughs> so you've been there too, okay? Uh, glad to be over it. So it's the same way in North Georgia. <laughs> yeah, right there with you. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you too. Okay, it's six, so we can get started. Uh, hopefully, we'll get our other two council members here shortly, since we need. We, I was hoping that all of the council could hear the same presentation. The purpose of this is to get everybody on the same, thought with the same foundation in terms of how the manager council form of government works and uh, to talk a little bit or at least to look through some of the things that are currently existing about the job description that has already been put together for our city manager. So with that, I invited Tom Belshi from the league who uh, is an expert on council, on on council uh, activities and the way council, councils work uh, since he represents the cities across the state and is exposed to all of the councils across the state. So he's brought in a short presentation to lay some foundation and then he's here for questions um, either during the presentation or, uh, it, or later in the presentation. Uh, Council Watson is going to be uh, participating in the same type of participation she had in our last regular meeting where she's going to be available uh, by uh, audio but not by video. She is still not feeling uh, perfect and so she uh, will be coming uh, in, she'll be coming in if she has comments or questions. So with that Tom I'll turn, I'll turn this meeting over to you and uh, give us your presentation. Thank you Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Uh, again my name is Tom Belshi. I'm the Executive Director of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. And I thought before I started my presentation on the council manager form of government, I just, uh, for those of you who aren't um, really familiar with, with the League of Cities and what we do, we are a um, nonprofit, nonpartisan, uh, voluntary uh, association of all 91 cities and towns in Arizona. And uh, the basic philosophy behind the League, all states, um, in the union have uh, a municipal league with the lone exception of Hawaii that just doesn't have a, enough cities to warrant it. Uh, uh, Hawaii runs on mostly a county type system. And so they're the only ones that don't have a municipal league, but municipal leagues across the state were, uh, were formed to first and foremost um, represent cities and towns and the interests, uh, consensus interest of cities and towns at the state legislature. And we also do a little bit of federal work uh, when it's appropriate. And, uh, but then also um, we look for opportunities where there is a service that we can provide that all cities and towns need and would be um, you know, inefficient or uh, expensive for you to do on your own. And we try to provide that for all 91 cities and towns. So for example, training. Um, uh, making sure uh, that you follow the state statutes, that you're complying uh, with things that the state requires of you is one thing that we can do on behalf of all 91 cities and towns. So um, this just happens to be a training that, that we do a lot. And uh, when I first started at the league, this is a uh, council manager form of government is something that uh, my boss, uh, Jack Dabalski, who was the executive director of the league for about 40 years, uh, it was something that he felt very strongly about. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically give you 
the presentation that he gave me when um, when I first became a staffer. And uh, and so I'm going to uh, switch over and share my screen and um, uh, I can run through it and, and uh, I'll leave it up to you all. Um, we can wait till the end to answer questions or if you want to jump in and ask a question as I'm going along, that won't uh, that won't throw me off my game. So feel free if you'd like to ask, ask a question to just unmute and ask it and I will stop the presentation and and see if we can answer the question. All right, so um, I just want to check and see um, if everyone can see my presentation. It's, it's coming through loud and clear. Perfect. Okay. So when we talk about the council manager form of government, we need to, to start off a little bit with, with the history. So right around the time of statehood for uh, the state of Arizona, um, you know, around 1910, of course, the, uh, we became a state in 1912. When we were talking about um, uh, the formation of, of the state, there was, we were right in, in uh, the midst of kind of a reform movement across the United States. In the 1890s, um, there was a lot of problem in, uh, a lot of problems in local government with a variety of things. You know, corruptions, inefficiency, um, the, you know, this is what we learned about in, in school when they talked about Tammany Hall in, in Chicago. Uh, what would happen is, is that there would be uh, local governments that would come in and uh, you would have, um, uh, you know, usually it would be the mayor that would come in. And when the mayor was elected, they would provide the administration. And oftentimes there would be, especially in large cities, mayors would come in. They put people that ran their campaigns in, in, in certain posts, and uh, there was a problem with corruption and, and other things like that. And so they started to talk about, there started to be a conversation about, well, what could be done so that the functions of policy and administration could be separate? In other words, is there a way that we could get people that knew the philosophy, who knew the cities and towns and what needed to happen and, and the planning that needed to go on and all of those um, types of functions could be put in a, a policy function and then have somebody or some uh, structure in place where you would have administration that was handled uh, separately. And there needed to be some kind of, of governmental uh, check and balance. And so, um, they started to take a look at the corporate structure. And so I um, uh, wanted to, to um, talk about the, the practices that, that went on there. So they, they, the, I'm gonna skip um, a couple of slides and I'll come back uh, to, to that council slide. But here we have the, the corporate structure. You had shareholders and you had a board of directors. Now the shareholders would elect the board of directors. And why did they elect that board of directors? Because that board had vision. They were people who um, the shareholders thought would represent their vision for how that company should be run. What kinds of products, what kinds of marketing, uh, what kinds of financial structures would be put in place so that the company would be successful. That board of directors was the vision and philosophy of the company, and they were elected by the shareholders to do just that. The board of directors then hires a chief executive officer that acts as the day-to-day -day operations of, of the, the company. And they hire uh, department heads uh, to run the different parts of the company, sales, research, development, et cetera. The idea being that there's, there's two reasons for that. Number one, you didn't have the same people who were making final decisions on directions for the company, also um, making financial decisions and hiring, and they had a separation from that, especially the financial part, the money uh, and, and the other assets of the company were out of reach. Now, that gave a level of separation for the board of directors 
and uh, the liability went down. And so you had a lot less problem with corruption in those types of corporate structures. So when they were talking about the council manager form of government, they did the same thing. You had the citizens that elect mayor and the city council. Again, mayor and city council, what do they do? They provide the uh, vision and, and direction that they want things to go. How do they do that? Well, they do that through the budget. They do it through planning and zoning. They do it through uh, those uh, general plan documents um, and planning and zoning maps and a budget and, and other things. In other words, they set through those documents the direction that they want the community to go in. Then they hire a city manager who, the, the, who makes decisions about who's going to be hired, who's going to be terminated, and carries out the will of the council, but yet also provides separation from the operations for exactly the same reason. And it gives a level of protection to the mayor and city council. And it also gives, um, it's also much easier to be an employee in this type of system. Imagine um, if a employee answered to uh, seven different bosses, it would be very difficult. Um, actually, you know, um, one of the problems that often comes up with the council manager form is that uh, the employers are used to taking um, uh, direction from their department heads that get their direction from the manager. And if you have the council added on top of that, who's giving, uh, you know, different direction to employees, they feel torn because obviously they want to make the council happy and, and uh, they want to do those things that the elected officials want. So when you think about this, think about, you know, um, I hear oftentimes that uh, we should run the city or town like a business. And what my reply to that is, is that we absolutely do. And we do it through the council manager form. Now, what we don't do is we don't do it as a, you know, a proprietary ship. We don't do it as a small business. Um, and that the big reason for that, uh, that we don't do it that way is because we have something called due process. And the council manager form of government protects due process. It allows citizens to participate uh, in the correct way uh, with the, the, the city government. So let's go back then and uh, we'll talk about uh, the council um, roles. Um, they, the council receives input from the public. That comes a lot of different ways. That's not just necessarily at the council meeting. Um, they receive input, uh, you know, from neighborhood meetings. Um, all of you know, uh, or are finding out if you're a brand new uh, uh, elected official on the city council, oftentimes um, you'll get caught in the store or at a soccer game or whatever it is that you're participating in where there might be members of the public, um, you're receiving input and uh, sometimes at inopportune times. Um, also, uh, once you receive that input, then you start setting policy. And as we talked about, you're approving budgets, you're establishing plans and goals, and then that the manager that you hire is responsible for carrying those things out. And one important um, aspect of council manager form that I neglected to to bring up is that if the manager is not conducting the business of the council in a way that they're comfortable with, a majority of the council voting in favor to remove the manager removes the manager. Uh, so that way they retain the authority of the, of the municipality. But under um, what a lot of uh, uh, new council members don't realize is that the vast majority of cities and towns have adopted the council manager form directly into their code. And so if you haven't had a chance to take a look at what is required um, from council members under your own code, I would uh, recommend um, taking a look at your code and, and what it requires of the manager and what it requires of the council. And uh, some people are very surprised that it was right there. They thought it was just a policy that was adopted, but no, it is an actual legal structure that you have adopted into your code. All right, so then let's go to what the manager's, um, what the manager's responsibilities are. 
The manager serves at the pleasure of the council. That just means, you know, if there are four members of the council of the seven member council that vote to remove them, then, then the manager can be removed. They implement the, the policy approved by the council. And um, so a lot of times what the council is looking for and, and what that manager and the other staff will do is when you are looking to move in a specific direction, you will rely on um, the, the, the staff to provide you with alternatives. And, uh, and then whatever alternative you choose, and if it's something, even if it's something different than what the staff is recommending, um, the council expects and the manager should carry out what that policy direction is. Um, they enforce the, uh, the ordinances and the, and the budgets of the, uh, of the community. And that's kind of, those, those are all things that are talked about in, in, as day-to-day -day operations. One of the other benefits of doing things this way is in Arizona, we have very few um, councils that have uh, council members and mayors that are full-time employees of, of the city that, that get uh, paid a salary to be members of the council. And so they are, a, they are working councils. They have full-time jobs um, or they're retired and they are just not uh, professional uh, council members. And so um, they need someone who is receiving training, um, who is uh, up to speed on the changes to uh, legislation, uh, to changes in best practices on a whole variety of things that the, uh, the city or town is looking at and is also connected with the professional development associations like the Arizona City County Management Association and the International City County Management Association and uh, with the league and all of the training opportunities that exist there. Um, them having that training, uh, again, helps to reduce your liability when, um, when things may happen because um, the council is not ne necessarily responsible for things that the manager may do that don't follow their specific direction. So these are all things that are meant to go towards the reduction of inefficiencies, the reduction of corruption, and gives the manager and the employees certainty about how they're gonna receive direction um, from the council. Um, right now, especially west of the Mississippi, um, this is the principal form of local government in the, um, in the United States. It has very high ethical standards. The, the International City County Management Association is one of the most um, demanding of its members in terms of ethical standards. Uh, ICMA puts out ethical guidelines that their members have to follow. And if they, um, if they go against any of the tenets of, that, of those, those, that set of ethical guidelines, um, they can be uh, censured and removed as uh, members of ICMA. And then that is actually published in their newsletter. And uh, so it's something that I can tell you that the managers take very, very seriously. And so um, uh, that, that engenders trust with councils and with members of the public that these are ethical, um, well-trained people that are helping to carry out the will of the council. Um, Non-political decision-making, especially in things like when they go out to, to work on contracts for the city, um, and when they work on um, uh, uh, economic development and all of those areas, um, they are taking a look at it from the standpoint of providing the most efficient, effective, and um, the most cost-effective services for the city. Um, again, I mentioned consistency and, and predictability for employees and, um, and efficiency and an installation for elected officials. So this, these are the things that, that we point to when we tell uh, communities that when it is working correctly, and I, again, I've been working with cities and towns in Arizona for over 25 years. And I will tell you that there's two ways that, that the council manager form can go wrong. And uh, the most common form is when the 
uh, elected officials in a city decide that they are going to uh, give direct demands on things like, um, I, you know, we've had council members who want to tell the public works department after they've received their instructions for the day, no, you're not going to go do this. You're going to go fill a pothole in, in this, on this street at this time. Um, that is, is very detrimental. And what we recommend and what we prefer to see and when, and when the council manager form works well is that if the council wants to give direction, um, you know, directly, it, it should go through the manager and the manager can talk with them about um, their desires for something particular to be done and how it can best be accomplished and why they're doing, why they may be directing staff to do something in particular on a particular day. Um, communication between the manager and mem members of the council solves a lot of those types of problems. The other way that it can go wrong is when the, the manager and the staff are basically um, trying to insert themselves in the policymaking process. Now, let me give you, let me give you um, kind of what I mean by that. Uh, if staff gives uh, them direction to bring back uh, uh, a host of ideas that they could consider and the staff brings back maybe one or two and it's clear that this is something that the staff desires more than the council, that's when a manager can get themselves in trouble. That's been more rare in my experience than uh, the other way around, um, but it, it still has happened and managers need to be very careful that they're not inserting themselves in the policymaking process, but really trying as best they can to effectively and efficiently carry out the will of the council. Um, that in a nutshell is, um, is what the council manager form of government is meant to do. Again, we have 91 um, uh, governments or cities and towns in Arizona. Uh, 87 have formally adopted the council manager form. The other four are very small communities and they have not adopted any particular form of government. But in my experience, again, those four communities, um, they simply don't, uh, they're so small that the clerk kind of fills the function of the manager and the clerk. And uh, sometimes even the HR director, they're just, you know, we're talking about communities um, well under a thousand people uh, in those instances. And so um, again, the vast majority of our communities that from the largest to the smallest uh, use this form, and we think it's a it's a good form that has served uh, the community the community as well. I'm going to jump out now uh, from broadcasting, and there we go. And uh, Mayor, uh, I am happy to answer any questions that uh, the council or anyone might have. Oh, well, and I'm I'm happy you're here to do that. Um, before we open it up to questions, I just want to make sure that council has uh, is at least aware and hopefully has taken a look at some of the materials that were provided in the packet for this work study. The uh, council manager form of government has been formally adopted in the city, and so it is spelled out in our ordinances. So the job and the responsibilities of the council, actually the job of the mayor and in, then the council um, is, in our, is in our ordinances and the basic duties of the city manager are, is covered by the ordinance, our ordinances. We also have a, a job description that is quite detailed on what responsibilities the city manager has excuse me, as part of his designation as city manager. So it's a, it's a detailed job description. And I think that's also been provided to you. And then the final thing, and, and maybe this gets a, at a little bit of what was being questioned at the last meeting. The last time that we did a search for a city manager, uh, as a council, uh, we drafted what we thought would be a statement that described the ideal manager. And I provided that to everybody so that you would get an idea of at least what the council was thinking of when we uh, went out and did our advertising and solicited applications for city manager and then eventually uh, hired uh, city manager Stevens. So that uh, you could see that um, both a very formalized job description uh, was part of that search and also this uh, the statement of what an ideal manager might be in a, you know, in a perfect world. 
So with that, uh, I'm, you know, we have Tom here for you know, the next little bit. So if there are any questions at all concerning the, you know, the role of the city manager, the role of the council, the role of the mayor, it would, this is a perfect time to bring, to bring up those questions because we've got, you know, we've got somebody from the league who can help us uh, work through that. Mr. Mayor, I had some questions. Yes, Councilman Rostosi. Thank you, sir. Um, Tom, thank you very much for the presentation. You're uh, welcome. I had a few questions. Um, my first question was, um, given your experience in cities that are well run where this works very effectively, describe to me what it looks like, how the council manages the manager, what that looks like. So that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, part of, of what happens with council manager is there's a regular review um, of the manager. And so, oh, my apologies. Um, the, the, so they will set up a, a review and that happens on a regular basis. Now, how often that happens, um, that depends on the community. And that is something that the council can discuss and they can discuss that with the manager. And um, they can talk about what their expectations are, but before the council reviews, we always recommend that you come to a consensus on what kind of questions that you're going to, what you're going to ask. And that as much as possible that you be on the same page for your expectations of, of what the manager should be doing. Um, also, I, again, I can't stress enough. Uh, there's two things that when we do our newly elected officials training um, that we do, uh, we just completed it not too long ago. Um, and we invite newly elected officials to come and to hear about a variety of, of issues. But in my part of the presentation, the two things that I recommend to the council is one, that you have a conversation with the manager about um, what your expectations are, how you would like to work with them, um, create an open door policy with um, the manager and the same thing with the attorney. Um, there are a number of things that you should bring up with the attorney. And so I think again, most of the problems that exist with council manager form are normally communication issues. Um, there are expectations uh, of the manager and the manager may be used to doing things one way and the, you know they've been directed by the council to do things a certain way a new council comes on, they may, now this doesn't change the code, but it may change the policies and it may change the direction. It may change how you, you know, review the manager, any of those kinds of things. So communication is, is really key. Also working through the, uh, the mayor as the, the figurehead is always the kind of the person who logistically brings these kinds of things together, organizes uh, the communications that you have in your review with the manager, but very, very much so what you should be looking at is if you came in and made very clear to the manager, um, the kinds of things that you're looking to accomplish, you know, as a council member. Now, remember, if you communicate what you have as a council member, the things that you would like to get done, the manager is responsible for what you decide to do as an entire council. But I think that if you communicate what you want to do and then you get the council to support those things, that's the best way that you can that you can work with the manager. But there's a review. And ultimately, if there's a majority of the council that doesn't feel that the manager is moving things in the right direction, a change can be made. Um, but I find most of the time that most of those problems are solved through communication directly with the manager. Thank you. Um, so I have two more questions. Um, I was curious the comparison between um, a corporate business corporate structure and the council manager relationship. Um, and I'm curious when it comes to setting direction um, for the city or the town, if I think about the corporate structure, then typically the CEO would actually be heavily involved with the board in figuring out the direction for the corporation. Um, most corporations, it's not the board just telling the CEO what you want, what they want. It's they're working together collaboratively to figure that out. So I'm curious if that analogy holds for the manager council structure or if that analogy falls apart. How's that supposed to work? I believe that it holds. And let me tell you why. Um, 
most of the time, again, um, let's say that, uh, you know, I always use a stupid dog leash law. Okay. Let's say that that's something that you want to do, but you're not sure. Um, and you have a staff in place and this is, this is the same in the business world. You may have shareholders that have an idea or vision about a certain product, but you know, they may want help from the staff that they have and, and the CEO on marketing and other things. So the, where the collaboration comes in is after you, you start talking about a certain vision or a value or, or something like that, and they bring you back alternatives that you can discuss. So you see, then, then that's, that's when the back and forth comes. Um, they start presenting you with ideas and data and you say, okay, oh, well, based on the data that you're showing us, we may want to go in this other direction. There is a back and forth that goes on when it's working well. And so what you really depend on your staff on, and I, and again, a lot of times um, where it falls apart is where if you have a council member that comes in, and again, I want to make sure that you all understand that when I do these presentations, I don't sit down with anybody ahead of time and talk about what's going on in particular in your community. So when I talk about this stuff, I talk about it just in terms of my experience. Sometimes council members come in and they have a distrust of the staff. And so they immediately think that, oh, I'm not getting all of the data from the staff, all of the information that I really could be receiving. In my experience, again, that's relatively rare that the staff is holding back something to drive policy in a certain direction. Most of the time they overproduce in terms of data and information so that you have everything you need to make decisions. So again, what I see is that when it's working well, I'll sit in a council meeting and you can tell because there's, there's questions going back and forth. Um, they're taking a look at the data and, um, and, they're, and you know, you're moving back and forth. And so you start to see motions by the council. Okay, well, let's amend what we talked about to reflect the information we've received from the staff. And that's when it's working well is when there's a collaboration. Um, so that's a good observation. I didn't make that clear, but that is absolutely the case when it's working well. Thank you. I just have one more question. I mean, it would be sort of a specific instance. Let's, let's just pretend we're a small town um, and I, I own, I'm not on the council, but I just, for the sake of this example, I own 20 acres in downtown that I would like to develop. Um, and so I've got obviously some strong interest in what happens. The city has some strong interest in what happens. Um, who do I go talk to? Um, who do I talk to and who's the ultimate decision maker? Because I'm going to want to talk to the decision maker at some point. So how is all that supposed to work? Okay. This is, this is something that we talk about a lot too. And in small towns, you know, my parents live in a small town and they are business owners. Okay. And if um, they were ever to run for council, um, you know, at which my father contemplated a couple of times, um, how do I deal with that? Well, again, this goes back first to what we were talking about in the beginning. This, this is the second conversation after talking to the manager, you go into the attorney's office and you say to the attorney, here's all the property and assets that me or, you know, my family members that live within the community. Sorry, the sorry, sorry. I, I, I don't actually own 20 acres. So it's not, not that I have a conflict of interest. I'm just, just pretend I'm not on the council. Oh, I'm, I see. I'm a okay. developer. I, I'm sorry. I misunderstood the question. Okay. Yeah, I'm a developer. So you're a developer. Okay. Again, that separation should exist with now the manager should be the ones having the manager should be the ones having the initial conversation. Now, um, then the manager will bring, usually that will end up on an agenda and you'll discuss it. You'll discuss it from a, a planning and zoning standpoint. You'll discuss it from an economic development um, philosophy standpoint. And of course, um, council members are gonna have strong opinions about what should be done with something like that. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that this is where the general plan is very important, is that the general plan has been built over time. And if it's been done correctly and actually legally, it's involved the input of um, the residents. 
and the residents decide, hey, this is where we'd like to see schools. This is where we'd like to see churches. This is where we'd like to see industrial. This is like where we'd like to see commercial. And so when you're going to make a change to the general plan, if that's something that you think is necessary, you need to do it very carefully and you need to do it with even more input from the community. And so that's, that's but it starts with the developer going in and talking nor normally the way that it works is they'll go in and talk with the manager and then the manager will communicate the desires. They'll bring the documents and um, they'll describe the conversations that they're having um, with uh, the developers. Now, having said that, okay, um, from community to community, sometimes there will be elected officials involved in that process. Personally, now, I'm not, you know, I get in trouble if I play attorney, okay? I let the attorneys be attorneys. I learned that from people like my good friend, Susan Goodwin, okay? I try to stay away from that. But in my, in my experience, the less direct contact that you have with those types of oper operations, uh, you know, right out of the gate as you're starting to get the initial information and, and you, the more due process that you can be um, a part of and, and the more open that those types of discussions are. When elected officials are having conversations with private businesses behind closed doors, that's when people get concerned. That's when they start to think my government is not very open. Now they expect the city manager to do that because they can't make the final decision. And so that's where I'm talking about the separation. And, um, and so that's why it's a good idea to have the manager start those but that doesn't mean that what ends up happening with the property the ideas that you would like to have aren't a part of the process it's just that it has to be done in an open way and the manager has to carry that message for you to the developers that they may be working with and so then just sorry one follow-up on that let's just pretend that um, in my efforts to get my project approved um, I, or get my project rolling i reach out to council members or the mayor um, what's the appropriate way for council members or the mayor to respond to me if I'm, if I'm wanting to have that closed door meeting that makes you nervous? <laughs> well, again, if I were a council member, what I would do, and I'm, I'm leaning on the attorney so that if I say something wrong, uh, they'll, they'll jump in and save me here. But um, what I would do if I were a council member is I'd say to the, uh, you know, the developer, it's really appropriate uh, for you to direct this first to the manager. We'll have the opportunity to hear from you most likely in a future council meeting. But right now, we'd, we would appreciate you starting there. And then we can ask our questions in public with you um, and, and people can see that happening. That would be my communication with, with a developer. Susan, do you have any, uh, or Joe, do you guys have any other recommendations? No, it usually comes in the form of an open meeting law question, but in, the, in terms of the, the, the politics and the practical running of the city, I think you're exactly right. I'm good. Thank you very much, Tom. Re really appreciate it. Oh, no problem at all. Just to uh, provide a little bit more uh, information to Councilman Rostosa, just so you know how it has worked in the past in Litchfield, at least when I've been mayor, when a request comes in, it comes into the, typically will come into the city staff, either through Pam or the city manager. Uh, if the developer asks to meet with me about the project, I do not meet with them alone ever. I only meet with the developer if I've been asked specifically and they, it gets sometimes pretty insistent. And then I have at least one, if not two members of staff in the meeting. So I'll always have the city manager. Sometimes we'll have Pam, sometimes we'll have assistant city manager. We always have staff there so that the discussions stay in an, in an appropriate um, in an appropriate area in an appropriate arena so that you don't have any implication that there's uh, something being just this, this inappropriate in and that is not and, and past, mayor and i would just add that's not unusual either um there's no, i think it's pretty i think it's pretty, pretty typical. typical yeah that what happens that where you start getting people raising their eyebrows is when the developers start meeting it with one or individual council members either individually or as a group without any staff 
uh, it would be a good idea, I think, for every council member to the extent they're going to ever talk with a developer that they follow the same rule, basically, and you have the city manager with you so that you can ensure that there's a third party that's overlooking the conversations that will make sure that the conversations stay in an appropriate arena. So I think that's good practice for, for all of us on council. So just as an adjunct, just as an adjunct to that, then at what point do we as a council find out about those meetings? We don't find about, out about them unless they come forth or that's, that's a question I have. You find out about them through the process of, of reviewing the, you know, the, the request that the developer has made. Typically the conversations that go on and the reason to have staff there is that there's nothing come, being discussed in that meeting that won't be part of the staff reports. So we have, you know, we have records of it and it comes to council through the normal staff reports. I, I'm actually really glad, Tom Rostozzi, that you brought this up because I think any one of us, I mean, I've had people ask me questions about what about those 20 acres? Oh, I love a store. I mean, obviously some of that is, is flippant, but some of those will not be. So what we are supposed, what we should do at that point is say, Here's the contact information for our city manager. That's right. that's my recommendation. Yes. Or on the golf course, or I mean, we're all we are yeah, yeah. on. And, we're all out there, you know. And again, you know what? This is exactly um, why you got elected to be council, as people want to reach out to you. Um, again, you can always take their input. It's just that you have to tell them in, to, in order to start the process. And this is again due process is where this is different now. If we were talking about an actual business and, and, and this was a small business and you were the, the Maverick CEO, you would take with it and run with it. It's, and that would be absolutely appropriate. But in this instance, the guarantee that I have as a member of the public is that all the deliberations, uh, again, normally when they have these meetings with the, with the mayor and the, and the manager or the manager, they're only talking about what they want to do. No decisions are being made. No value judgments are taking place. No debate about whether it's a good or bad idea is taking place. That takes place, the debate takes place in public. And so I, as a member of the public, my guarantee from the constitution is that I get to hear the debate. And that's where the open, that is the basic foundation of the open meeting law is that whenever you're debating the virtues or vices of a specific policy position, I get to hear that debate. The problem that people have is when, you know, I'll give you an example, okay? There was a, a little community up in the White Mountains, you know, near where my parents live, that before the council meeting, four of the seven members would get together, they'd go through the agenda and decide how they were gonna vote. And they would have all the discussion there and then those were efficient council meetings, boy. They got there and in 15 minutes they were done. Um, the whole idea is I'm, you know, regardless, I'm a, I'm a Gilbert resident. I follow very closely what the town of Gilbert does. And so I look at the agenda and I know what they're gonna talk about and I get to see the debate and I get to see how the council members that I'm voting for are, you know, what their value position. And I not only form an opinion about them as, as a council member, but also about what's coming before them. And I get to see what their judgment is like and all of those types of things. That's what I'm guaranteed in the constitution. So that's why we wanna make sure that you're not, you know, uh, that, that you're not coming to a decision with, you know, or, or, or an understanding with any developer, well, I'm gonna vote, yes, don't worry. That's what they don't wanna have happen. They wanna see that, okay, well, I really like this project. Uh, can you tell me more about, you know, such and such? People want to see that, and they want to see you talking for the first time with them when you're you're making a value judgment about their project. Um, question: The yes, mayor. our code says that the mayor is the head of the city for all official and ceremonial purposes. Oftentimes these developers will come to the city and somehow see the process, you'll know, be directed to the manager 
and the mayor gets involved, you know, with that meeting with the developer also. And sometimes some of those projects are such that there are things that probably don't fit uh, within the city or need some negotiation or some tweaking to get them to the point where, you know, the manager, the staff, the mayor can recommend them to council. How involved should the mayor and the vice mayor in some of these situations uh, be in some of these negotiations with these developers trying to put together a plan? It comes to council. Again, um, that's more of a, now you're getting into, that's not really um, contemplated by statute. That's more of a local policy. Um, and that's where communication with the mayor about your level of comfort with it is a discussion that you should have as a council. Um, having the mayor involved or having a mayor and a council member involved in those discussions um, to, uh, is not atypical. In fact, it's, it's fairly typical. But what's discussed, how, you know, what level, usually all that happens in those meetings is the manager and, and the mayor or, or, again, like I've seen in other cities, they'll have the mayor and a council member or three, you know, council. again, they can't have a quorum, obviously. But they'll be in just to hear it and so that, that they can help um, that developer maybe discuss it at the council meeting, talk about uh, what they understand the project to be in terms that the council may, may understand. That is all policy, okay? That is what you decide that you're comfortable with as a council. So that's not really something I can tell you how it should or shouldn't be done because it's not, there's not a, a, a compliance issue there. So that's something that, that you'll decide as a group, you know, with consultation with your attorneys and with the mayor and, and others. So um, that, that's, I'm gonna leave it at that. Any other questions from council? Uh, I don't see any. Tom, I appreciate you coming down and, uh, and making your presentation and answering questions and helping to facilitate, uh, you know, the, some, you know, the, the discussions that we've had this evening. So thank you. Um, it's my pleasure. And, and again, um, just one other thing that I, you know, uh, that I would like to say is, um, we have a whole variety of, of resources um, on our website. Um, if, if there are legal questions that, uh, you know, your attorneys are very well versed in, you know, using the league as a, as a resource, um, we don't ever try to supplant any services that your staff does, but we are there to help provide additional resources and information, usually from our experience with all the cities and towns. And so, I just want to make you aware of that and uh, we're here to help in any way that we can. So I appreciate the invitation, uh, Mayor, and uh, look forward to uh, coming out and visiting you in person at some point in the future. Sounds good. With that, we're going to adjourn the uh, this work study session and we will get started on the regular meeting. Does anyone on the council desire a few minute break? Yes. Mayor, Mayor, the, the agenda says seven o'clock. It says immediately following the work study session is what I see. Am I looking oh, at I'm it? I'm in the wrong agenda. Wrong? I'm sorry. <laughs> I pulled up the no, wrong agenda. You had me worried because I've only been trying for probably six or eight months to get that language on these. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> well, I thought I saw it, but it could have been wishful thinking. No, so. you're right. All right, so let's go over to <laughs> City Clerk. Terry, is your hand up, Terry? Yes. Can I get a motion, please? I'm sorry. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Um, yeah, I'm not. All right, we can do that in a work study. Yeah. So you want to you want to do that? So is there a motion to adjourn the work study? So moved. By the vice mayor. Is there a second? Second by Councilman Rostosi. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now we're adjourned. So does anyone on the council, do, would anyone like a, a minute or two before we start the regular meeting? Uh, well, I see a thumbs up. Does that mean yes, you want a minute or no, you're good? Yes, a minute, please. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a five minute break and then we will 
come back, come back and begin the uh, the special, the uh, regular council meeting. So we'll be back shortly.
Okay, if we get, uh, I guess we need the vice mayor back and then we can get started maybe. All right, vice mayor's back. Okay, I think uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out quorums, but I, can, I think I'm counting significantly more than five. So with that, we're gonna call this regular meeting of the city council to order. If you'd please rise and uh, join us in the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States of America. And to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, we'll get started with Councilman uh, reports. Councilman Romack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been uh, working hard and staying close to home. So I really <laughs> don't have uh, much to add, although I did walk around the, uh, the uh, Christmas in the park and uh, I've been involved in it since I think about its inception. And I'll tell you, it was, uh, it, it, it's good to see it continue on, but uh, I wish it would have uh, uh, been a little bit more uh, user-friendly. That's all I got. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, how about uh, Councilman Ostosi? Um, just real quick, I just wanna say again, I appreciate the training we just had from, from the Arizona League of Cities and Towns, um, and I was, I thought maybe after the training was over, we might spend some time talking about um, our city manager opening and where we want to go with that, which we did not. So I guess I would just ask that on a future agenda, we add that as an agenda item so we could spend some time as a council talking about where we want to go as far as the city manager opening is concerned. No, we can, yeah, we can certainly do that. And I apologize, uh, did not know you'd wish to talk about something further. If you'd brought it up, we could have stayed in work in the work study and done that, but we can do it. We can do it in the future, certainly. Uh, Councilman Donahue. Um, actually, though I was sad to attend, it was awesome to attend the dinner for Susan. Sad because I'm sorry she's retiring, but it was lovely. And so once again, enjoyed spending time with you and very happy to hear that you will be back to visit us in your retirement. But um, anyway, that was a lovely dinner for you. Um, secondly, it was a blast putting together a video for the uh, virtual great, the program. And I just want to say to Sonny and Trisha that I see her on here and I know they had a whole team that put that together, but the virtual part of it was just awesome. Uh, I mean, you guys did a great job. Just loved those little floats coming by. It was it was really well done. So bravo to you guys. That's all. Thank you, Councilman Claire. I just want to echo what Ann just said about the uh, the virtual parade. I felt that was really well done. It's always been a big part of the park as long as I've been here and. It was nice to see the uh, creativity of the team come together and put something to be able to get out there for the citizens. And everyone that participated, I thought it was great. Hey, um, Councilman Brandon Watson, I know you're on here with the audio. Look, I don't see your square anymore. Would you like to say anything, Councilman? Yeah, I, I really don't have anything to report. I'm kind of quarantining right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Faith. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to wish uh, Susan Goodwin and Bill Stevens uh, success in this next stage of life that they're about to embark upon. Uh, good luck to you and great working with you all these years and don't be a stranger. Come back. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to tag on to a couple of comments from earlier councilmen. The, uh, the Christmas in the parade, uh, virtual parade was excellent and I the work that Sonny and, and Trish did and, and Christian, our videographer, uh, it was fantastic. And it was, the show was, was really well, I think it was really well done. Uh, and I wanna congratulate you, uh, you guys and staff on, 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 on the job that you guys did. And even coming up with the idea to do it was, was very good. Uh, 
just before the parade, I was uh, happy to attend along with Councilman Romack, the employee awards luncheon for the year. And it was, uh, it was, it was a very nice event. Uh, again, staff did a great job in, in planning it in a way that it was, it was safe for all the people who came. Uh, everyone who was there, you know, while they were moving around had masks on and everyone seated was, you know, was six feet or more apart. So it was a very safe event. It was outside and it was windy. So if there was any virus floating around the wind, took it down, down the block. So it was a very good event and it was nice. It was nice giving out the awards to the different uh, employees. And it was nice saying uh, goodbye and seeing this, seeing our employees say goodbye to, to the city manager. Uh, they all went together and got the city manager a very special gift, uh, you know, from their own donation. Um, this is a, a fact about the city manager that probably no one on council knows about, and I'm going to save it until we say goodbye to him, because I think it's something that we want to be able to spotlight him at the time that we talk about this particular uh, hobby or talent that he uh, he has. Um, and uh, I also want to say goodbye to Susan. You know, I, I, I don't know if you're going to be here for another meeting or not. I hope so. Uh, you're certainly, you're always welcome to be here. Uh, we want to welcome Joe. I know Joe's going to do a good job. He's already had an opportunity to provide the city some advice. And, it's, and, and I don't know if he went back to Susan before he gave the advice or if it just came naturally, but he gave advice that could very well have come from Susan directly. So it was a it's, it has, the, the relationship with Joe has started out on a very positive note. So uh, goodbye to Susan, and thank you for all your service to the city over these decades. And it's hard to say decades, but the sad thing is I think I've been around the city uh, even longer than your decades, and I remember you being here. So uh, thank you for all that service, and, uh, and welcome to Joe, and I, I'm sure you're gonna do a great job for us. Uh, and with that, I am done with my report. So we'll go to any, meeting my, it looks like we have Paul Litchfield Heritage Center is in front of the city manager. So we're gonna to go to the PW Litchfield Heritage Center report. And I'm assuming it's being given by Nancy. All you have to do is unmute. There you go. There you go. Thank you very much, Mayor Schiff, I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. Happy holidays. And before I proceed in our report, I want to wish the very best from all of the historical society from our board and everyone uh, to Susan Goodwin and Bill Stevens. We wish you both the, the very best in the coming years, whatever your plans are. So thank you so much for all you've both done for us, as well as the city. I'm co. Okay, so anyway, I'm Nancy Schaefer, and I'm president of the Litchfield Park Historical Society. And uh, so I'm going to give you a rundown first on the capital campaign funds for the PW Litchfield Heritage Center project. Our latest project donations, I'm excited to give a nice report. We received a letter of intent from Sun Health, which we accepted. They are donating uh, 131,000 to the heritage project. Uh, the money will be available once construction begins. And this money is based on $1,000 per independent living residence that exists now. In addition, they intend to donate a sustaining long-term gift, which will be $1,000 for every new residence built based on a total of 900 residences in the Sun Health Master Plan. So obviously this is gonna span quite a few years, but this will be um, really helpful for our operating expenses once the project is completed and we move forward just as they move forward with their expansion. So we're very, very pleased with that. Um, we thank everyone at Sun Health for their donation. Um, moving on to the project, on December 3rd, the project was approved to move forward by the City of Litchfield Park Design Review Board. This approval is with the understanding that some infrastructure items 
we'll need review before we move to permitting. Um, Orchid and Waltz are working with the city engineer and building department to ensure these items meet standard specifications before we move forward. And this includes street lighting per APS standard specifications, access for waste management, drainage, a new sewer line, water retention basins, and options for access control and monument lighting. So those are all up for discussion and I, I apologize if I left something out, but um, okay. And then also our team is working with the city of Goodyear Fire Department to ensure we meet their requirements for access and for fire abatement, should there be a fire. Um, so we need, we know we need to meet code with them, but we are all um, Orchid Vaults and LPHS. Uh, we're all in uh, communication with the fire department to make sure we meet their requirements. We had a group meeting about a week ago with Orchid Waltz and our civil engineer from Hillgard. The core testing has been completed and the diagnostics are in and uh, they just today received the final report. So any adjustments that will be need, uh, that will need to be made to the um, plans will be done before the final, final plans are, are available for cost estimating. And we anticipate the final plans for detailed cost estimating will be available by mid-January of uh, 2021. Finally, we are currently researching details for the AV audiovisual audio IT information, information technology and security for the building. We're currently looking for qualified local firms that are interested in providing the design and installation of these systems. Um, we're asking interested subcontractors to leave their information on our uh, museum voicemail. And we already have a package to provide them the building floor plans and electrical layout. We've already um, been given a couple of names and then Waltz Construction also gave us a couple of names of um, firms that they've worked with, but we really wanna reach out to anyone uh, in the local community that uh, would be interested in this project and this part of the project, because that's an area that Orchid and Waltz don't really work in. So we need to reach out and uh, set up the design for those areas uh, ahead of time before the plans are completed. So that's it for right now until um, about mid-January, which hopefully will be before our next meeting. Um, are there any questions from anyone? Questions from the council? I don't see any. Uh, I think we're all happy that you're continuing to make progress. And we're pleased that you're uh, seeing some support from Sun Health and Rancho La Loma. Uh, hopefully the two of you will grow in your partnership as you each uh, grow in, in the, uh, you know, in, the, in completing your projects. So. Thank you for the report and we'll we'll talk to you the next time you come to, before us. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Next item is the city manager's report on current events. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Um, so the Arizona City County Managers Association put on a next generation leadership training event. It was a few hours on one particular day and I authorized all of the department heads or department head equivalents to attend. I don't know that they all did, but many of them did and they felt that it was um, good training to help them as we do, um, as we get ready for succession training and, and uh, planning, if you will. Uh, so everyone had, had got some really good training out of that. Uh, as you know, you've all talked about the uh, Christmas in the Park event. We also had the um, Arts Festival in November we were able to complete that. That went off very well as, uh, as well. Um, youth sports is still to some extent uh, moving forward. Tennis lessons are full. Um, we're taking all the ne necessary precautions there to do that in a safe way to keep people um, separated, wearing masks and socially distanced, et cetera. 
preschool, uh, as some of you may have remember, they opened up and then we turned around about a week later and sent students back to do uh, online uh, learning. And we're still in that status for online learning and we're doing weekly planning for that um, study sessions and it seems to be working out well. So far, so good. And um, some of the students are really excited and enthusiastic about being engaged through social media. So who would know that, but um, they're really enjoying that. Uh, finance, uh, we of course, you'll hear later about the audit uh, that was done and completed. And I'll leave all of the, the news on that to Paige and to our guest from the audit agency who will be doing a presentation on that, but that has been completed. And we, we of course put out the word to the local businesses for COVID-19 business uh, assistance uh, loans from the CARES Act. We got 11 applications. You'll also hear about that later on this evening and you'll get some presentation on who those 11 are. And um, we're continuing to hire uh, a couple of positions, one over in the rec center for a, a preschool aid slash cashier position that's needed. And we're also uh, hiring for a public works maintenance technician that's ongoing. And uh, the mayor mentioned that we did the employee assistance council um, holiday luncheon and that went off very well. I thought it was very nicely done and uh, very nicely arranged to keep people apart. And uh, so that, that was a, a fun event to go to as well. And um, of course we have uh, the usual public works activity. They've been working day to day. Uh, just as usual, and they've been keeping up with the things that are, are needed to be done here in the city um, for uh, planning and a little bit in building and somewhat in engineering. We're still working with uh, businesses that are planning on building and opening businesses at the corner of Dysert and Camelback. We've got the car wash in progress. We've got um, a couple of side-by-side -side fast food restaurants, and then we also have Denny's who is working towards completing a plan and building on that corner as well. And um, that, there's a ton more going on. We've met with the um, uh, Peninsula HOA to talk about the flooding pro or the project to help prevent flooding in the peninsula. And uh, uh, we, which happened about four years ago, five years ago, there was a lot of excess flooding that went on and we had in one particular cul-de-sac uh, flooding all the way up to about two feet in their front room, their garages. They had to open their back slider doors and let the water flow out the back to the golf course. So we've been working on a project to prevent that from happening again. And uh, I'm happy to say that the Peninsula HOA has voted to accept the plan. And, uh, and the good news on that is because that plan was accepted, we're able to execute um, a large, uh, almost a million dollars in grant funding from the county to help to do all of those fixes. And we've also got some grant money to finish up a large uh, project for uh, preventing flooding downtown. Uh, some of you may remember many years ago, 20 to be exact, this began. And several years after that, we finally got the third of five phases built. So there were two phases remaining and we were able to get a grant for that to help move forward to finish those last two phases that'll help with the uh, water flow. And the um, important part about that is all part of that plan will also help move water away from the city center once that gets built, because currently when some of that water floods, it goes right into the middle of the big dirt lot behind city hall and just sits there until it soaks down through the ground. This particular pro uh, project will help to, to cause that water to be taken away from the lot and allow the city center, once it gets built, not to have that standing water on the lot there. So we've got quite a number of things going on. We've got mill and overlay uh, that's about to happen on Litchfield Road. We're still working on getting a good bid for the uh, perimeter wall phase five. That's in progress as well to finish up the wall from the golf cart overpass all the way up to Bird Lane. And um, we had uh, 
JDM partners met with us, uh, for, with me and the, and the mayor and uh, the assistant city manager, uh, Mr. Tom O'Malley met with us and we talked about the 15 acres. We talked about some changes that may go on in the wigwam. They have been discussing with a new potential uh, investor partner that uh, if it comes to light, we'll then move some projects forward within the compound of the wigwam and then it will we'll allow them to put together a plan to submit again to the city for the 15 acres across the street at the corner of Litchfield Road and Wigwam. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But so those are some of the issues that are going on. There's a ton more uh, that of course are in my report. So uh, with that, I will take any questions if you have them. Questions from council. I don't see any. So it looks like you've wrapped up your final report, Mr. City Manager. Thank you. And I wanted to say thank you to everybody here that made earlier comments and well wishes. I appreciate that. And I'll save the rest for later because we have an agenda item to tell me to, to leave. <laughs> Show you the door, so to speak, huh? In a friendly way. And that's the good news is it doesn't often happen for city managers. They get shown the door in, in a not good way. And in this case, it's been an exceptional uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is a proclamation. Uh, as has been custom since we started virtual meetings, I'm not gonna read the entire proclamation, it's in your packet. I do wanna mention that it is a particularly important uh, program. Uh, we have far too many of our young people who die unnecessarily through suicide and or otherwise adopt uh, lifestyle lifestyle situations that end up with, uh, end up hurting their potential to grow and become the people that they could be. Uh, there's a program called Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life that has been going on for quite some time now that has been very successful at training many young people to, uh, to help equip them with the skills that are necessary so that they will speak up and stand up so that people can help support uh, some of our youth that are that are having or experiencing problems before those problems manifest themselves in you know in the taking of a life. So this proclamation asks people to support the uh, Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life month, uh, and I would ask each of you to read the proclamation and to take it to heart. It's a very very important program. Uh, with that, we're going to go on to the next presentation, which is about the automatic. License plate readers, and that I assume is coming from Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. So as you will remember, we've been talking about these camera systems for some time. At previous meetings, Council had asked that we come back to you with updates on the system as we go along. So there were three prerequisites established for the purchase of these camera systems. One was the MOU, one was the letter guarantee and the prices, and the third one was locations. So you will remember the letter we received that, that letter guaranteed the price of these cameras for the two years of the contract, so we do have that. Um, as far as the MOU goes, so the MOU was supposed to go to the Board of Supervisors in December, however, it did not because it didn't make it through legal in time. So it will be on the County Board of Supervisors agenda for January. Um, that being said, it's my understanding that the MOU has been approved by Maricopa County Legal Offices. It's just a matter of it going forward to the Board of Supervisors for approval. So I did speak with Captain Broughton about that and also to Flock Safety about that. So I think it's just a matter again of going before the Board of Supervisors as far as the MOU goes. As far as the locations go, I know there were a lot of questions about locations before. So if you'll bear with me here, I'm gonna pull up the share screen so you can see all the camera locations. And I certainly welcome questions if there are any. Just one second. Sorry, I'm trying to get pulled up here. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Okay, can everyone see those locations? Yes. 
Yes. Thank you, Mayor. So as you'll see, this is 32 camera locations as discussed to cover ingress and egress for all neighborhood entrances throughout the city. Um, some of these I'll focus on specifically. Well, I did have a lengthy meeting about these cameras with Flock Safety and myself and also the city engineer about these. We tried to get as many of these on city, pro uh, city properties as we possibly could for obvious reasons. A few of them that was not possible. These in this area here, these are the ones on Denny Boulevard. Um, I have spoke with Paul Vanderbeen about these. He has requested that we move these further back to the roundabout. I, I think that works. I see no reason why that wouldn't work. It is, of course, on their property. And this is what we want to cover. Either way, we're still covering traffic going in and out. Um, Sun Health has also requested in the future we add additional cameras as they have more entrances that get developed as Sun Health builds, builds out. So we would want to add more cameras later on. Mr. Vice Mayor, you had had some questions about these as far as Sunset Terrace goes. So you have Missouri Avenue, Serrano Terrace at 138th. So I did speak with Sunset Terrace about these. They are supportive of this project. These cameras would be on private property and they do think this is a good idea. They're very happy to see us doing this. Um, we are waiting for a letter back from their HOA saying that on their letterhead, we have not received that letter yet, but it's my understanding they are supportive of this project. Um, one thing you might know, they had asked if we could put an additional camera on their greenway along Fry's because they've had some issues with people actually jumping over the walls into backyards along that greenway. However, the issue there is these cameras don't, they're not made for people, they're made for cars, they're made for tags. So that would require another type of camera. I did ask Flock Safety that exact question and Flock Safety agreed with me that it wouldn't be the proper camera to catch that type of system, to catch a person. Again, these cameras are for tags and cars not person recognition. I just thought that should be noted. But again, these are the two locations on 138th. So if we can scroll down some, so let's look at this one. This one's number 17. So as you see, it would be pointing northbound on 138th. And here's the different views. If I clicked on the other one that's on 138th, it would be right here in this area. See it right here, that's number seven. And there it is. So again, both of these are on Sunset Terrace property, but again, they are supportive of these. Now to zoom out, it's right too far. Again, there are 32 locations throughout the city for these cameras. Again, ingress, egress for any community in the city. I would welcome questions or try to go over these if there's any questions about a, about a specific location, I'll be more than glad to. Questions from the council. And I, and speak up because I can't see it, hardly anybody without we're in a screen sharing mode. I can come out of share screen, sir. It doesn't look like we have any questions. Hi. I got a question, Mayor. Oh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, uh, Matthew, how many cameras are we talking about putting on private property? Four, sir, at this time. I'm kind of struggling with that concept. Does the city attorney have any problems with that? And how far does this go? I mean, you stopped it apparently when they wanted to put them people jumping over the fences. Um. Well, I'll just jump in. Um, the, yeah. You would need an agreement, some kind of a license agreement, but is what we usually do when we have um, things on private property or when other people have things on our property. So it does need a, a, an agreement. We'll make sure that the uh, that we get something drafted up and and then it comes back to council for approval approval of the agreements themselves. We tried to put as many of them on city property as we possibly could, again for obvious reasons. But some of them just for the angles that we need, and of course right of ways are different depending where you are in the city. Some of them to catch the entrances, they just they they need to be on 
private property. Any other questions from council? Yeah, I don't see any. Thank you for your report, Matthew. Keep us informed as this thing goes forward. Uh, I'm glad to see that we have, uh, you know, you've developed more specific information about the actual placement uh, of the cameras themselves. And those uh, is the is. Do we have that map in our in our packets? That in, and is, if we do, is it interactive where we can actually go down to see on a particular flag exactly where it is within the community, like you just pulled up? No, sir, it's not in your packet. It'd be much easier for me just to send you guys the hyperlink and then you okay. can go to it and play with it that way and see the different camera locations. I think it would be a good um, idea to, to do that, to send out, to send us each a hyperlink and, and also maybe if, if it's possible to include that on our website. So if people have questions about it, they can take a look at where the cameras are gonna be installed and what views they may have. Absolutely, sir, be glad to. All Thank right. you, Mayor and Council. Okay, next item is the fiscal 2020 audit. Beige Peterson, do you have a report for us? Did you guys make it through the audit without having to go to jail or anything nasty like that? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mayor. Luckily, nobody nobody ended up in jail this year, so it was a Good. successful audit. Um, yeah, we have uh, Mr. Stephen Palmer here from Hinton Burdick. They're our contracted audit firm. And so just really quickly before he um, presents, I just wanted to thank everybody because this really is a citywide effort that takes a lot of um, collaboration and cooperation from everybody to have a timely, successful audit. So I really appreciate everybody's help and especially the finance staff. They were very helpful, especially um, as my first year here. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Stephen Palmer. He's going to share his screen. He has a presentation to present. Hey, thank you, Paige, and good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, I'd like to reiter reiterate what Paige said about the uh, wonderful help uh, that we received from the staff. Uh, your staff is is excellent, uh, to put it to put it mildly. Um, they give us everything we ask for, and they're very cooperative, and they helped us get through the audit process in a very timely and efficient manner. I'm pleased to report that nobody's going to jail, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> and I, obviously, I'm kidding. Our our staff does <laughs> right, right, right. And we I'm have, you know, we have, well. we have been fortunate to have a history of clean audits and the receipt of innumerable awards for our financial um, section. So I'm right. sure that Paige has led a successful effort to continue that trend. She has, and that's exactly what I'm going to report on tonight. Okay, there we go. So when we complete an, an, an audit, there are several reports that we issue in conjunction with the financial statement. The first being the independent auditor's report. This is the report where we put in layman's terms whether or not the city passed their audit. And I'm pleased to report that the city did pass in layman's terms. We issued an unmodified or a clean opinion, if you will, on the city's financial statements, which means that in our opinion, as the independent auditors, uh, it's our opinion that city's financial statements present fairly the city's financial position and the results of the city's financial operations uh, for fiscal year 2020. Um, we also are required to issue a report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance. This is where we note if there are any problems. Um, there are three different items that we can report here, material weaknesses being the most significant, uh, of lesser significance, but still quite significant is a category defined as significant deficiencies. And here we also report on compliance related issues. If the city weren't in compliance with a grant agreement, for example. And I'm very pleased to report that we have no items that are required to be mentioned in this report. Lastly, we issue a report on, this on the city's compliance with state legal requirements. Um, the HERF being the most significant that you're probably familiar with, the highway user revenue funds. And I'm pleased to report that we also issued an unmodified or a clean opinion here, meaning that we did not note any issues. 
<clears throat> Let's take a, a brief look at the city's finances. Just from the 10,000 foot level, I know that you get more detailed reports from your staff. I just wanted to go through these items very briefly with you. Uh, the total net position of the city or the equity, meaning if you were to take the city's assets, subtract the liabilities, that residual amount being the equity, was about $32.5 million at June 30th, 2020. And over time, whether or not this number increases or decreases, it's a good indication of whether or not the city's financial health is improving or deteriorating. So how the city do in fiscal year 20? The net position increased by about four and a half million dollars. Very positive. Um, the city had some significant capital asset activity. Uh, this would be machinery, equipment, property, infrastructure, all those kinds of items. Um, capital assets had a net decrease of 506,000, and I'd like to explain to you the details of that number. Um, the city acquired about $600,000 of capital assets, disposed of capital assets that were booked at 126,000, and the city also recognized depreciation expense of 1.1 million. So the net of all these numbers resulted in a net decrease of 506,000. Uh, some of the more significant items that the city acquired um, were the preliminary expenses on the city center and the, and the perimeter wall projects. Uh, you acquired some audio visual teleconferencing equipment and some playground equipment in the, in the Camelback Park. Um, the city's debt, the city's debt was 8.7 million at the end of the year. 173,000 of that is compensated absences. So if all of your employees were to quit on the same day, that's how much you would owe them for vacation time and the like that they hadn't taken. Um, the city has about $3 million in the net pension OPEB liability. Um, those of you that have been around for a little while uh, probably recall that it's been about five years ago now, um, the accounting rules changed and we had to recognize the liability on the city's books for the proportionate share of the net pension liability or the, the monies that will be owed to city employees when they retire. The city had about five and a half million dollars in bonds payable. Um, and you can see the two different debt issues there. And overall, the city's long-term debt decreased by about 400,000. And in fiscal year 21, the city will, be, uh, will need to ma make debt payments of around 550,000. Let's take a quick look at the general fund as it's the, the largest and most significant of the city's funds. Uh, that top line represents the assets in the general fund. The middle line represents the equity and the bottom line represents the liabilities. As you can see, there's a good margin between assets and liabilities. That's a very positive thing to see. And as you can see that trend, the trend of the general fund is very positive. Uh, the, the, the fund is, is accumulating resources to be used for future city projects. Here's the cash fund trend in the general fund, also very positive. And last but not least, the revenue and expenditure trend of the general fund, the top line being the revenues and the bottom line being the expenditures. You can see there's a good margin there uh, where the city's revenues for over the past four years have exceeded uh, the expenditures. That's the view from 10,000 feet of the city's finances. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you um, how the audit went. It went very well. Uh, I know I said it before, but I just can't compliment uh, the city staff enough for all the help that they provided for us. They did a great job and we certainly appreciate it. And with that, here is my contact information. I'll be happy to answer any questions now. If any questions come to mind later that you'd like to run by me, this is where you can get a hold of me. Uh, Paige also has this information. And uh, so with that, can I answer any questions for you? Mr. Palmer, let me first say uh, thank you for the work that you did on behalf of the city. And I think this is the first year we've used your firm. Is that correct? The second year. Second year. Okay. Yes. So we'll have a, at least maybe one more year and then we look at our contract again. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. I'd have to look at it, but I, I believe that's correct. Okay. Well, 
Thank you for the work that you've you know that you've done in, in uh, confirming that that Paige and all of her staff that report to her are doing a great job keep keeping track uh, and accounting for our funds and our and our expenditures. So Paige, please extend the council's appreciation for all the efforts in your department that you know that we're able to produce this result from our auditor. Are there any questions from council or any comments that a council member would like to make? I don't see any. So, uh, Mr. Palmer, thank you again for your presentation, and we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you and your firm in the future. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next item of business is our public safety uh, monthly reports. Good year fire department being up first. And I don't know who's here from the, oh, Chief Wayne's here. No? Nope. Yes, yes, sir. Let me. Okay. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, they have the fire chief. I'll present the uh, review October's stats for uh, for service. I'll start with prevention and development services. Plan reviews: we had one permits, one construction inspections, four couple new occupancies that set up on uh, Dysart and Camelback, um, and then we had 25 occupancy occupancy inspections as well. Um, note the spike in that number. That's due to uh, how we're doing accounting for our inspections. For example, we did a LOMA last month and normally that would be counted as one. Um, that's 10 separate buildings. So thus the, the increase, sharp increase in, in numbers for inspections. Um, monthly incident reporting, fires and explosions, we had zero. Um, our normal rough number of 41 EMS calls one hazardous conditions, three calls for service, three good intent, and then four false alarms. Overall, for a total of 52, and that's on average for the month of October, or sorry, November. And uh, we're on pace for what we had done last year, about 700 calls. That's the report in a nutshell. I'll remain on for any questions. That you may have. Any questions from council? I don't see any, Chief. Uh, thank you for coming down and giving us a presentation, and thank you for your service and and all of the firefighter service to our community. Please express our appreciation to them. You guys do a great you do a great job for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We're proud to serve, and and uh, Mr. Stevens, we'll miss you. You've been a great partner. Okay, we're going to go on then to the uh, county sheriff's report. And uh, I don't know if Captain Branton is here or not. I can't tell with his screen. Lieutenant Keller standing in oh. for Captain Broughton today. Welcome, Lieutenant. Thanks for coming down. Welcome, Mayor. Um, there's not much that I've seen in the report that's gone up. The things that do concern me are the residential and vehicle thefts have gone up. Um, within the month, we did have a case that we did catch someone um, outside of Litchfield Park that was tied to a lot of vehicle thefts. So we're hoping that that took care of the problem. But there is a lot of vehicle thefts and uh, um, residential burglaries or burglary alarms that have gone up, not significantly, just about twice as much as they were the month before. Um, as far as uh, criminal damage and graffiti, that's gone up about three times as much. And then animal problems has gone up about seven times as much as the month before. And suspicious activities have gone up about 15 the month before were three. So that, that's gone up more people reporting suspicious activity to us. I have nothing further than that. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes, who's, who's hands up? Councilman Romack. Councilman Romack, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Lieutenant, thanks for everything you do, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, in looking at this report, um, you notice that it says July, in 2020, July, August, September, and then it jumps to November. Do you think right. that some of these numbers could be, uh, 
October and November together? Or no, it's a, it, just a typo at the top is what I'm looking at. Okay, you see what I'm talking about. Yeah, I see what I saw what you're talking about. I, I was reviewing this before I got to you folks. Okay. And I've had it printed out for a while. Yeah, I was just hoping that it was two months instead of one, but who you knows? All right, no, it's, gone, it's gone up significantly and in the last month is what it looks like to me. Any other questions from council? Mr. Mayor, Councilman Rostosi. Councilman Rostosi. Yes, um, a bunch of the events happened, it looked like, in one evening in Litchfield Greens. Uh, I think it was Green Tree Road. Um, you mentioned that somebody had been arrested. Was it associated with that activity or was it something different? It was associated with activity outside of Litchfield Park. Um, it was close to that area, but we can't pin it to that area. Okay, but I mean, I guess you made it sound like you had arrested someone who you thought might have been responsible for some of the activities. I was curious if it was those same activities or if it was different activities. It was, it was breaking into cars and stealing stuff. He happened to leave his driver's license in one of the cars he broke into. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from council? Uh, I just have one question. Do you know? Do you know? Have, have any um, apprehensions been made on the on this graffiti and criminal graffiti and criminal damage? Not that I'm aware of right now, sir. And I haven't heard anything from the detective sergeants or anybody in the district. Does MCSO still have someone who looks at the uh, particular graffiti and tries to identify? similar characteristics to you know known graffiti people in terms of what's being put on the put on our property i don't know if we still have that or not i'd have to look into that and i can get back to you on that mayor okay i'd appreciate it if you would that's there's a lot of these things some of the some of these end up being more of a concern to residents than others and graffiti is one that is, is certainly is noticeable in our community so I, i'd appreciate it if you could let us know what's you know any more information you have on that particular uh, item. Yes, All right, sir. anything else from any council member? Thank you very much for your report, Lieutenant. Uh, we'll see someone, either you or someone else in a month. Please let your guys know we appreciate the service they give to our community. Thank you. Next item is staff reports and we're gonna start off with a report from Ms. Peterson on finance. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to share my screen and start out with um, the sales tax update. So um, our November sales tax, uh, we had another um, positive month. Our retail sales were up 14% uh, um, this November compared to last November. Um, the online sales, um, November of 2019 was the first month that this started, the Wayfair Act lawsuit, and it's up 109%, but I, I believe that was probably a reporting and education error because our average online sales since it started is around 30,000. Um, restaurant and bars, unfortunately, were down um, 11%. Utilities are up 28, uh, rentals are up 19, and other is down 15, which is expected. This is where um, the tourism revenue um, falls in. But um, grand total, it's up 9% over this <clears throat> over November of 2019. And then our construction sales tax, we had a, a really good month. It's up 65%. So the two of those together were up 17% over November of 2019. And year over year, um, sales tax is up 23% and construction sales tax is up 19%. So another really good month. Just to get a visual um, how well sales tax has been performing since fiscal year 19. Um, it'll be interesting uh, when we get our January numbers. This is typically the Black Friday reporting, um, but we'll still have a couple more months until we see that. Um, before I move on to the full financial report, are there any questions about sales tax? Questions from the council? 
Looks like not. Please continue. Okay. This is the general fund summary um, through November 30th, which is 42% of the year, fiscal year. Um, our local taxes, which the bulk of that is what I just went, o went over, is at 47%, so we're 5% over budget, so doing well. Um, the rest of these categories are, are right where we um, expected them to be. The ones that are lower, we can, um, that's directly related to um, COVID. And grand total, um, we're at 42%. So the areas that are doing well are making up for the areas that are not doing as well. Hey, um, just, operating. Uh, before you go past this, did, did we did we actually budget $100,000 in interest income? We did, and I that's something I've actually been looking into because, as you can see, we've only we've only collected 3,800. Um, last year, we we did collect a lot of um, interest income. Prior years, we did not. Um, so I I want to have a a better update for you um, next month. Okay, thank you. Um, our operating expenses by department, um, grand total, if you looked at the general fund as a whole, we're at 36%. And like I mentioned earlier, we're at 42% of the year. So um, spending wise, we're doing very well. Um, we have just a couple departments that are just over on the 42%, but a lot of that is due to the timing of invoices and larger payments that are um, do at the beginning of the year. So nothing I'm concerned about there. Um, construction sales tax, we're at 58% of budget. And I, I realized after I submitted this for the agenda packet, I left out our capital expenses. So I need to correct this and I'll make sure it's corrected next month. But we've spent $363,650 on capital. And those are mostly the projects that um, Woody has been working on. So I apologize for that. I will make sure that is corrected. Um, net change in our fund balance is um, $2 million. And ending fund balance is 14.5 less that 360,000 I just mentioned. Um, recreation services. Um, Um, our revenue and recreation services is um, 26,844. It is significantly less than last year, but that's to be expected um, with the uh, COVID restrictions. And the special events revenue total 42,611 and their expenses were 75,636. The HER fund, um, we're, revenue is coming in slightly under budget. Um, this is directly related to gas tax. Um, so I don't really have any explanation for that. We'll just have to monitor that and see how it comes in. There's still a healthy fund balance in the fund though. Um, the street maintenance expenditures, um, just under 79,000 or at 79%, they've been um, busy doing a lot of projects. And the street capital projects are just under 200,000 or at 26%. And their net change in fund balance is a negative 89,000. And their fund balance at the end of November is just over 1.2 million. Uh, the street light improvement districts, um, as you all know, this is um, basically a pass through. Um, it's assessed on property taxes and to pay the light bill. So it's doing exactly um, what it should be. The court enhancement fee um, it's earned a little interest. It has a balance of 192,000. And our fund balance summary, the general fund, um, this is 14.5. Um, I need to subtract out that 363, so it's really 14.2. Our special revenue funds are just over 1.6. So a grand total of roughly 16 million. Um, which leaves us with about 20 months of general fund operating expenses, which is 
um, a very, very healthy um, fund balance. And that is all I have. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from council? I see any hands? No, I do not. Thank you for your report, uh, Ms. Peterson. And uh, thank you for the good work, you're, again, that your staff and you are doing on keeping control and reporting our financial situ situation uh, accurately. So pass on, thank you. pass on the council's appreciation for that to your staff. I will do that, thank you. All right, that takes us then to our consent agenda. Items seven, A through D. Uh, item number D, we're gonna remove from consent because I have a couple of questions of staff. Is there any other item on here that a council, any council member would like to remove from consent? Motion to approve. Items, it's been moved to approve item seven A through C. Um, is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Rostosi. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, consent agenda is adopted as presented item 7A through C. On item number 7D, uh, uh, Tricia, I just would like to have a, make sure we have a good explanation of how you're gonna maintain the spacing between people. And I am I pulled it off consent because I, I don't know if it, I'm, there may be other council, other council members that have questions uh, uh, on the safety of this event. I think because all of us who have seen this event over the years, we think about there being a mass of people around the lake, like bees on a on a honey a honey hive, and it, so it's hard to imagine exactly what you're going to do to make sure that we have a safe event and don't end up with with problems of spreading COVID. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure, I will do my best to try to explain this and answer any questions that you may have. Um, in terms of the spacing, you'll see on your packet page 71 that um, we've included a map, which is a perimeter, excuse me, of the lake. So this year, as opposed to everyone just going out and grabbing whatever space they can, we would be having people register in advance for 10 foot spaces. And whether that's one person or up to four people maximum within that space, it would be people within immediate families or um, people within close contact that are comfortable with each other. They would be in that 10 foot of space fishing. And then between each of those spaces, we'll have an additional six feet so each group will have that distancing between them. Um, actually, it'll probably be slightly more than the six feet of space. Um, we just measured out to see exactly how much linear footage we could have in there. So you could technically have up to 187 spaces around the perimeter of the lake, those 10 foot spaces that people would register for and have their groups in. We'd work with public works to mark those out so that people would know exactly where their spaces are. Um, when they pre-register, they'll get that designated spot to go to. And um, we will, will the have- spaces, Will the spaces be numbered or somehow marked, you know, labeled so that the person who registers, that's the only place they're supposed to be? Yes. That would be part of the online registration process. All right. Um, we don't have to go up to that maximum of 187 10 foot spaces, technically 16 foot spaces. Um, we were estimating that we would go up to a maximum of 175, but we certainly can decide that we want to take that down to just 100 spaces that go around the perimeter of the lake. Um, it's a matter of what council's comfort level is, if they're comfortable doing it. We're putting the options before you of what we, um, the special events team feels that we can safely control. 
And from there, if you guys decide that you'd like to take that down a notch and expand the space between, we're certainly willing to do that too. How are you going to control people to see that they stay in this 10 foot area and that they don't end up in the six foot area also? Um, we'd have MCSO and posse members on site and extra staffing to be um, roaming the perimeter to ensure that that happens. Okay, any questions or comments from Council Vice Mayor Faith? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the area behind the townhomes to the south where we built the sidewalk out into the lake, mm -hmm. there's only a couple of feet of grass in there. How are you going to maintain traffic, people walking? How do you maintain as narrow as that is, how do you maintain that separation? Um, you know, that's a good question. Perhaps those are areas where we decide that we don't have anybody stationed along that perimeter and we mark oh, off yeah. that space. We'll look at that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is there are certain spots or along the lake, which because of the terrain, the aerators, the depth mm -hmm. are prime spots on the lake. How are you going to handle trying to apportion those out? Are they gonna go on site and first come first term registering for a certain numbered spot? You're gonna pass them out? How are you gonna- it, it would be online registration, first come first serve. And they're and... gonna be assigned a numbered spot? Mm -hmm. Correct. And they pick their own, they, can they pick out a spot like number 23 or do they just get number 23 if they're the 23rd group that signs up? Um, our intent would be to just um, number them one by one and go along and fill them in order and not necessarily have people pick prime spots. I think that would make it kind of complicated to yes. have people do that. So it would just be a matter of first come, first serve on the registration site, and you would be allotted the spot that we choose for you in order. Be prepared to address that when this pops up. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments from council? Yeah, yeah actually, all I all I want to comment on that is, you know what, Trisha, of course, this year you can just say all things COVID, all things COVID. I mean, rules are rules. It can't be complicated for you. That'd be a nightmare. So your posse and your police might be enforcing. <laughs> I hope not. I hope people are nice. Anyway. Uh, I, li I like the idea of, of eliminate, eliminating the people in along the sidewalk in front of the condos. I, I think that would, you know, that would be asking the people in the condos um, that would be asking a lot for them to put up with, with that many people and right that close to their, you know, their backyards, basically. So it would be better not to have people in that area, um, you know, in this derby. So it'll just be an open area. Okay. Uh, then the other question I had, I, I know there's, they're going to, there's going to be a mask re requirement as people come and go. Do they have to wear the masks while they're fishing also? Is that, was that part of the deal or not? We would be asking them to do that, yes. Same way as if they were walking the festivals. So it's masks. If you're at the event, you got to wear a mask. Period. Correct, yes. All right. Okay. Uh, does anybody on the council uh, feel uncomfortable with the concept of these 10 foot, 10 foot spots with six feet on each side of the spot? Is everybody comfortable with that and with four people in, those, in, those, in, that, in that 10 foot area? I don't see anybody objecting. So, what? How about? Is there any objection to not having any not having um, fishing happen in front of the condos to the south of the condos along that sidewalk? Any anyone on council concerned about that? Okay. Then what I would like to see is a motion from council to. Uh, allow the special events department to host the trout fishing derby at the lake on Saturday, the January 23rd um, with 
in accordance with the memorandum that they provided to us, but modified to remove fishing in south of the condos um, along that sidewalk. Is oh, there a motion? motion. No, so moved. moved by Councilman Donahue, seconded by Councilman Clare. All right, any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I believe I've got a vote here from Councilman Watson, who is Watson is an aye, so it passes unanimously. Uh, good luck, Tricia. And, and make sure we have plenty of enforcement so it doesn't get out of hand. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you for, for doing a good job to get a, at least a, allow us the potential to have it again. Oh, and then just one uh, one item just to make sure that staff doesn't forget. Under the under the governor's order, it is mandatory that the mitigation plan for this event be submitted to the state uh, ahead of time with the drawings and, and full explanations of how we're gonna mitigate the, the risk, okay? All right. Now we're gonna go on to regular business item eight. Uh, the first item is interviewing applicants for board and commission appointments. And before, uh, before we actually do the interviews, uh, I have a question for Terry. I know Terry, there you are, Terry. Um, how, I know we intend to have a vote on this yet this evening. So how are we gonna vote? We, didn't, we don't have, I didn't see any voting uh, paperwork in our packet. Are we gonna, how are we gonna do that? If you can send it to me in the chat feature. All right, okay. Report it here and then announce it. Okay, perfect. All right, so we're gonna interview to fulfill the, to fill these um, open spots. We have um, applicants for the Recreation and Public Grounds Commission and also for planning and zoning. We're gonna take the applicants uh, for Recreation and Public Grounds first and we're gonna do it in the order that they uh, are on the, uh, on our council communication. So what we typically do is, uh, is is to allow each person who has applied to make a one or two minute brief presentation to council on why, on why you think you would be a good commissioner, why you think the council should choose you, why you applied for the commission, uh, whatever you'd like to say to us. Uh, we, we have in our packets and have, had and have had a chance to go over the application that you each submitted to the city so we know about your background and, and we know about the time you've lived here and those kinds of things. So if you could just give us a, a brief explanation of something you think it would be important for us to know about you. And then we'll, uh, once we have that, if there are any questions from council of each applicant, there'll be, uh, there'll be time to do that before we go to the next applicant. Typically we do this uh, in a situation in which all of the applicants are uh, outside the room, and so they don't hear the applicants don't hear each other. Uh, unfortunately, with given this situation, I, you know, it's going to be difficult to do that. We haven't really set up a separate room to put the applicants all in. I assume Terry, is that right, or do you have a separate room? I can put them in back in the waiting room if you tell me who goes first. I'll put the okay, other. Okay, well, we're going to go for we're going to go in order that's on this sheet. So the first person is going to be Brian Colbreth. Okay, and then give me it's going to go to Brian Faith and Carrie Gianjobi. Okay, let me get the others in the waiting room. All right, so we'll bring you back out of the waiting room once the per, the, the first person, the second person have made their made their um, statements. Okay, so we're left with Brian Colbreth now, and I can see you, Brian, down at the bottom of the screen, at least the bottom of my screen. Welcome to the to the uh, council meeting, and you have the floor for a for a short presentation of anything you'd like to say to the council, and then the council can ask questions if they have any. Okay, sounds good. Uh, thank you to the mayor and council for uh, having me here tonight. Um, just to tell you a quick uh, little bit about me, uh, I grew up here in Litchfield Park, um, attended uh, Litchfield and uh, graduated from Alfreya High School. Um, 
got my bachelor's degree from NAU. So I've, I've grown up and, and lived in Arizona my whole life. Um, I now live here uh, in Litchfield with my wife, Stephanie. And uh, she also grew up here in the area and we have three children. And um, yeah, I'm looking to join the uh, Recreation Public Grounds Commission. Um, my family really enjoys living in the park and we uh, utilize you know, all the parks and, and public spaces. And uh, just, just overall, I, um, I really feel like Litchfield Park is a special place and I wanna do whatever I can to uh, be involved in helping keep it that way for, for future generations. Hey, thank you for your presentation. Are there questions or comments from the council? Okay, I do not see any. Um, again, understand, Brian, that we have we have your application and your written materials in front of us, so those generally answer most of the questions the council has. Okay, so we'll go on to our second applicant, which is Brian Faith. You can bring him, bring Brian in, please, Terry. It says he's joining. Okay, he's here. He's sideways, there he is. He's still sideways. Okay, we've got you, Brian. Uh, you have you have the floor uh, again for a, you know, a short statement of whatever you might want the council to, to uh, know about you. We have your we have your written application, so you know a lot of the things we have before us. So it, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, that takes a lot off the table, um, but uh, you, can, you can talk about anything you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I am interested in in mostly to to serve the community. You know, as some of you already know, I'm a born and raised in Litchfield Park and back. Uh, after college with my wife seven or eight years ago. And uh, there's a lot of big projects the city has. So personally, I mean, I'd be interested to be involved in them. Uh, but, you know, most importantly is, you know, giving back what I what I can, you know, I, I plan to live here forever. Um, and it's the kind of kind of thing where there's only so much land, you know, you only get one shot to, to do it right. Um, and uh, my my background is economics and finance, which you know could could possibly help in uh, kind of guiding the discussion on on various parks and recs things. It, it'll always come into play as much as uh, actually planning it out and making it work. Um, but yeah, I mean, with with that, I've was involved a lot in the city as a kid uh, growing up with with scouts. I'm an Eagle Scout and I've uh, always, always been involved, but I uh, haven't been too involved since since moving back and I wanna get back into that. So looking looking forward to it. And with that, I mean, that's, that's what I got. All right, thank you, appreciate your comments. Any questions from anyone on the council? You yeah, don't see any questions. Again, remember we have your we have your written materials, so most of the questions that we typically have are answered in those materials. We appreciate you uh, putting in an application and and, uh, and coming tonight to make the statement. Yes, thank now, you. Now we'll go on to Carrie Jean Joby. Okay, hey, Carrie. Carrie is with us. Again, uh, this is an opportunity for you to make a statement to the council about anything you think we need, that you would like to us to know about you or about why you applied. We have your written material and we've, we have looked at it. So the floor is yours, Carrie, but you have to unmute yourself. There you go. I just did, thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Um, I decided uh, when I learned of the need for people to apply for these particular uh, commissions that my interest in serving shows no limits and no bounds. So as someone who used to help 
spent probably close to 10 summers of my life as a lifeguard and helped with uh, lifeguarding a little bit at the rack uh, for Litchfield Elementary School. I understand some of what goes on and the importance of keeping these programs and keeping new, new ideas uh, and the budgeting for all these things um, so that we are in a good financial position to offer these amenities to the families of Litchfield Park. So it's a variety of reasons that uh, I'd be willing to serve. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any questions from council? Seeing none, uh, it looks like it looks like we're set up in terms of the way we have agendized this, that we're gonna have all of the candidates make their statements and ask any questions. And then under item, the first item, the first part of item B, and then and then hold the votes for all, for both commissions uh, all at the same time. So we will now call in the planning and zoning applicants. And there, the order actually is not, you know, the order has Carrie coming third, but since you're with us, Carrie, you might just as well talk to us. Do you have anything else you'd like to say about planning and zoning that's different from, from the recreation and ground, public grounds? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mayor. I, I feel that the planning is number one. And of course, the zoning will help dictate what can be planned. And the discussion from various city council meetings and the commission has really delved into some very interesting uh, issues, which I find interesting uh, from a variety of vantage points. And I think it's important to have a good mix of people with a good variety of backgrounds to be able to contribute to that vision. And so I would throw my hat in as well. All right, well, thank you. Are there any questions of uh, Carrie Jean Joby about the planning and zoning spot? Okay, again, I don't see any. So thank you for your comments and for your, your interest in applying for these spots. Uh, we'll, we're gonna go on now to our, back to the top of the list on this, on this list that I have, which is Robert Dare. Robert Dare, Dare, am I saying your last name correctly, Dare? Robert? Hello, it's uh, Dairy, like the cow. Dairy, okay, sorry for mispronouncing it. Yeah, no, you, no would, problem, a lot of people do that, not a big deal. Do um, you prefer Robert or Bob? Bob. Okay, Bob, the uh, floor is yours to, to, to make any type of a short statement you'd like to make to the council relative to your application for planning and zoning. Uh, we do have your application packet with us, so we've already looked at that. Um, okay. And with that, the floor is open uh, open to you. I got, I got from uh, somebody in the uh, uh, little list of questions, and if those are the questions you want me to kind of figure out, you know, I'm married for 50 years, three daughters, three grandkids, moved here in uh, 2017 from Paradise Valley. I'm a, uh, a licensed general contractor with a five digit license. So I've been in business for a long time and I uh, met uh, John Romack, uh, you know, in various meetings and, and talked to him. Um, leadership qualities, uh, my pride is uh, the fact that I was one of the founding board members of Stardust Building Material, a nonprofit building material organization here in the Valley that uh, has been open for 24 years now and uh, retired from them, uh, spent 38 years in the military uh, with my background as a contractor, uh, spent a lot of time on meetings at P&Z, uh, especially in Par town of Paradise Valley. And uh, so I've been coming to the meetings here, uh, you know, if some in person and some on the video. Uh, Pam uh, knows who I am because I show up, not very many people show up to those meetings unless you have a need, uh, but I have an interest. Uh, my whole goal for showing up, my wife says, why do you care? Well, because 
I live in the town and the town, what it goes on in the town is important. And if you don't will, are willing to volunteer and stand up and uh, help, then uh, you have no room to argue about uh, somebody doing something wrong. So that's kind of where I'm at and be glad to answer any questions if you have questions. Any questions from council? I, I have a question. Uh, what if you were on the Planning and Zoning Commission and you were presented with a, with a question of changing the existing zoning or land use for a parcel, what factors would you take into account in determining whether you would support the change or not support the change? History of the, uh, of the city, what has happened in the past with those, if there's similar requests, most of these requests normally are never unique. There's somebody else saw it done, want to know if they can do it. Uh, what impact it has on the uh, neighbors, what impact it has on the uh, city overall, uh, and is it uh, ultimately better for the city or is it uh, a detriment? And uh, those are the kind of things that, you know, having been in the remodeling business now for, for over 40 years, uh, people always have strange ideas and sometimes it's practical and other times it's, uh, you know, let's work around it. Okay. Any other questions? Still no questions from council? Thank you for your making your application. We appreciate your interest in the spot and uh, we will go on to our next applicant and then make a decision. Next one is Robert Field. Uh, hello, Robert. Hello. Do you prefer Robert or Bob? I go by Bob. Okay. Well, Bob, the uh, the floor is yours to uh, to tell us anything you think that would be helpful for us to know in making this decision on uh, the applicant for Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I was working at Palo Verde in 1982 uh, when in 1985, I was invited to a party in Litchfield Park and I just fell in love with the place. It was a, an oasis in the desert, green, a lot of greenery, uh, houses, it, it looked beautiful. And I made a commitment to myself that one day I would live there. And in 1994, I made that happen. I moved, I bought a house on Villa Nueva. And in 2005, I moved to my, our house in, uh, on Bird Lane. Um, I just love standing there in the window and looking out at the, the, all the traffic on Bird Lane and saying hi to neighbors. It's, it feels like such a wonderful community to me. Um, I think that uh, uh, because of my love for Mitchfield Park, I would want to act as a good uh, steward of our city so that we can continue to cultivate what our forebears gave us and preserve it for future generations. Um, I'm not sure of, uh, you, you talk about the time uh, uh, requirement. I, I guess I haven't done my homework. I'm not sure of the time requirement that uh, would it, this would entail, but uh, I'm, I'm eager to serve. And I think that summarizes where I am. Thank you for your, uh, for your comments. Are there any questions from council? Yeah, I, I just have one question, uh, Bob, and that is, if you were sitting on the Planning and Zoning Commission and an applicant brought in an application that would require this, the uh, city to change the land use designation for the parcel of property that was involved, what factors would you look at in determining whether you would support or not support the request to change? Well, I think we need to preserve and protect our property values. Uh, that's the largest investment we have, most of us have. And so I would look at it from a property value standpoint and a quality of life standpoint. If, uh, if we're pushing that envelope and, and pushing comfort zones, uh, I would not be in favor of it. Okay, any, no other questions from council? Okay, thank you very much for your comments and we will uh, we'll move on and get back to you. Last person is, uh, is Tiffany, it's like springing. Probably got that one wrong.
Uh, hello, Tiffany. Hello. Uh, how is your last name pronounced? It's pronounced Springen. Oh, I actually got it close. Usually I'm really bad with names and I came pretty close on yours. And, so, what, did, and, and what did you call me? <laughs> well, I think I called you Springen. Springen? So, yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah, some people say Springer and some people think it has an H, but yep, just Springen. Okay, perfect. Well, this is an opportunity for you to, to address the council and talk about anything you think that would be important for us to know or that you think would be good to know in making this determination on planning and zoning. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council for the opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna highlight some of the things that weren't on my application since you said you had that or that have changed since the time I initially applied and uh, that'll kind of highlight my leadership. So for the past six years, I have volunteered through Maricopa County Department of Emergency Management at uh, the reception and care center where I'm the safety officer. The uh, RCC has to demonstrate every year that we can process 20% of the population living within a 10 mile emergency planning zone. In this case, it's, it's mainly related to the nuclear plant, Palo Verde. So we partner in conjunction with them and every year it's reviewed by FEMA. And so as the safety officer there, I lead all the safety efforts when the drills take place. I have a small group of people that I direct to ensure that there aren't any tripping hazards or safety issues uh, when we start to have the public come through. And ultimately I'm responsible for the safety of all the evacuees. And hopefully we never have an incident. Uh, I am also, I think on my application at the time, I am currently the training supervisor for the Maricopa County Assessor's Office where I oversee all the education and training for our appraisal staff. I work with the Arizona Department of Revenue to ensure all our appraisers are certified and keeping up with their continuing education requirements, which are required by statute. And then in August of this year, I was asked to take over leading the human resource group as well. So this additional responsibility has doubled my staff size and my workload. I direct the work of 10 employees in various HR and training functions. And I coach and work with developing the managers and supervisors at the assessor's office. And I've also had to build relationships with county HR because they are a partner um, in several of the HR functions. So just having said that, I feel through my volunteer effort and my everyday job, I am good at building relationships and leading teams. And I think I would be an asset to the Planning and Zoning Commission because I understand property values. And I think about how decisions would affect others and this community. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any questions from council? Yeah, I just have one question. Uh, if if you were sitting on the Planning and Zoning Commission and an applicant brought in a request to change the land use of a particular parcel of, of land, uh, what factors would you consider in deciding whether to support the change in land use or to deny it? Well, you just dive right in. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I guess I would have to, um, one, look at um, how it's originally zoned. So I think about the property where they built the residence next to the parking lot of the wigwam um, for, for the golf course there. I mean, I'm sure that was zoned commercially before and they came in and asked to um, build a, a, a house there on um, quite a large lot. Uh, I don't know the factors that went into making that decision, uh, but I mean, had it been a decision I would have looked at, I probably would have preferred that it be built next to uh, the existing house and had the parking lot for the golf course moved down to that. So it seemed like sort of a seamless uh, residential um, street versus uh, breaking up with the parking lot and, and the, the residents in between. So I think there's just a lot of factors that you would have to consider uh, when looking that, 
uh, how it's going to affect the neighborhood, the aesthetics of the property, um, you know, factors like that. Thank you for thank you for your for your uh, answer. Are, are there any questions that, from council? Um, just as a piece of information, the the lot the lot you're referring to actually was zoned residential, so oh, was it, it? Was, its use was not changed. Oh, nice. So, and the parking lot actually is zoned residential. But oh, it, it is. A, but it yeah. has a special it has a special use permit from before the time before we were a city. Great. So it has it had some existing it had an existing rights before we were incorporated. So with that, uh, I think we're done with your interview and we can get on to our voting. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you for thank you for your interest in the council and hope you've gone so quickly you can't hear me now. <laughs> thank you, Terry. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna use the chat feature on the on our computers here. We can <laughs> chat. I'm sorry. Yes, do Terry. Me, do you want me yes. to keep them all in the waiting room while you vote, or do you want them present? No, you probably should let them all back in now because this is public. This I don't is know public. how to do this chat you're talking about. You don't know how to do it. You're going to be in trouble. Down at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat feature. See the if you go to the bottom of your screen, it says or the chat. top. Click, or click the top. Chat. It's at the top of my screen. Well, right, it's at the bottom it, of mine. Wherever it's it is, it's either the top or the bottom. You click on the chat chat feature and then uh there should you, you want to go in and and we want to send a chat to uh terry to terry roth chat got it right so it says when you oh, when you open it up it's going to say it's going to say a group chat but we don't want group chat so we have to pick terry All right, so now I've got, I've not used the private chat. How do we get to private chat, Terry? Double click on Terry's name in the participant list and that'll bring up the chat feature. Okay, perfect. So it automatically comes up to chat and then you can type in your votes. Yeah. yeah, and go to the very, very bottom down there. You can't Type under the word chat. You got to go to the very, very bottom down there and click on that. Where it says, name. yeah, where send, it says two, right? Send yes. two, yeah. yeah. So remind us, Tom, how many people were choosing and which one? You're voting for two people on recreation and public grounds between uh, three applicants, which okay. the applicants are Brian Colbreth, Brian Faith, and Carrie G. and Joby. Okay. And then, and then for planning and zoning, you're voting for one one applicant out right. of four applicants, okay. and those applicants are Bob Derry, Bob Fields, Carrie G and Joby, and Tiffany Springen. Okay. A question for the city attorney. Yes. They, yes, yes Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, Susan, uh, two of these applicants for Parks and Rec are my Eagle Scouts, and one of them is my son. Do I have a conflict of interest? <laughs> do they have a pecuniary interest or do you have a pecuniary interest in their appointment? No. Are you can you be unbiased yeah. in your in your vote? Yes. Then you're fine. <laughs> but I would while I have the floor, I would remind you that um, it will take them it may take a couple of votes, especially on the first commission, um, but it will take a majority of the council to vote for each of the candidates that get appointed. Yeah. Okay, so now I have a little square here. Am I supposed to be typing names into that square? Oh, no, no. no, you're gonna have two Jerry Roth privately. You see that? I'm gonna have what? In your your no, little I square. Have, I have it to everyone. <laughs> you see all the participants? I it doesn't say all well, participants, it just says everyone. Click on the yes. next arrow and select me. Go Click down. on everyone. There you go. Click on here's, the here's Terry Roth. Okay. Terry Roth. Click on her. Privately. Privately. Okay, so now I can type in what I want to vote. And remember that everyone's vote will be read.
Is it working, John? Yeah, it is actually. I, I don't know why or how, but it is. Perfect. <laughs> I'm on a roll. Don't give me, don't slow me down here. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilman Claire. Can I just make a comment to all the applicants? Uh, you can, but let's, let, let us get to the voting part done. And then once everybody's got their votes done and while Terry's compiling them, then you're welcome to make a comment. Thank you, sir. So how's everyone coming? They're not gonna figure out how to send it. I'm waiting just, for John. What? Just, just hit uh, enter. Well, that's easy for you to say, but I don't see any enter here. No, no, on your, on your computer where it oh, says enter. enter. Oh, it may say there. send. Did it, did did it, it go? Terry? I got it. Yeah. All right, so we have everybody in, Terry. Yes, sir. everybody has voted and I have it. All right, so Councilman, Councilman Claire, well, before you say anything, Councilman Claire, if you have a comment to the to the applicants, you're, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, just say thank you to each and one, every one of you for, for taking the time to come and, and submit your applications tonight and, and to want to be part of the city. I came out of Recreation and Public Grounds. It's a, it's a great group. Um, and uh, if, if you're not selected on this round, to please continue to be involved. One of the great things about this city is the community involvement and um, continue to be involved and do what you can to help us grow and, and maintain this charmed little town that we have. Okay, so what are the results of the first round of balloting? Vice Mayor Faith for Recreation and Public Grounds Commission has voted for Brian Faith and Brian Colbreth. For PNZ, he's voted for Robert Field. Council Member Claire has voted for Brian Colbreth and Brian Faith for RPG and Robert Derry for PNZ. Council Member Donahue has voted for Brian Colbreth and Brian Faith and Robert Derry for PNZ. Uh, Lisa Brainerd Watson has voted for Brian Faith and Brian Colbreth for RPG and Bob Derry for PNZ. Council Member Romack has voted for Brian Colbreth and Brian Faith for RPG and Tiffany Spring for PNZ. Tom Rostozzi, Council Member Rostozzi has voted for Brian Faith and Brian Colbreth for RPG and Bob Derry for PNZ. And Mayor Schoff has voted for Brian Colbreth and Brian Faith for RPG and Bob Field for PNZ. So my, uh, does that give a, a majority of the council to uh, Bob Derry on PNZ? It does. It does? Yeah. Ms. City Attorney, you concur with that? Or Mr. City Attorney, well, we'll we're not gonna ask you, Susan. Joe, does that you, do you see the results? Are you happy that it we, we have a we have a majority? Yes. Okay. So then you you want to announce the uh, the the the, uh, the the vote winners, please. The winners uh, that will be seated for a Re recreation and public grounds commission will be Brian Colbreth and Brian Faith, and the planning and zoning seat will be filled by Robert Derry. Okay, do we need to actually do, uh, you know, to swear them in or are we just going to I do will, that in March? I will, I will have them uh, come to City Hall to sign their oaths of office. Okay, congratulations to those who won. Uh, to those who did, did, did not, please continue, uh, continue your interest in the city and hopefully we'll apply again in the future. Uh, we need people on the commissions uh, on a regular basis. So the, these openings come up, you know, they come up 
throughout the years, every every so often. Uh, and it, it's critical that we have the participation of our residents on these commissions to keep Litchfield Park the kind of place it is today. The reason, that, one of the reasons it's such a special place is because we have the input of our residents on a regular basis, basis uh, both through these commissions and through the city council. So thank you for making the applications. For those that were chosen, um, you know, we look forward to you participating in these commissions and uh, help, you know, helping us continue to move Litchfield, Far Litchfield Park forward uh, for the benefit of our residents. So thank you. With that, we will go on to our next order of business, which is award of the Business Assistance Program funds. We have a presentation from Ms. Peterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, we received um, 11 applications for the Business Assistance Program. And what I did is I um, summarized all of them into um, the two page format. So hopefully it's um, easy to go through these. I'm going to share my screen. And before I get started, Mayor, um, do you just want me to run through the summary of each one? Well, I, what I'm thinking with 11 applicants running through the summary at, at, uh, at this time, we're going to be at midnight when we get finished. So I'm wondering if, if council will agree to this, if we, if we could simply have questions from council of sp about specific applicants, if there are questions. Uh, or if or if council feels strongly you would like Paige to go through each of these applications, we can do that. So comments from the council first. I, I would like to. Donahue, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just like to have her read off who they are. I don't think we need all the details, but I think well, yeah, a lot of these. Start, yeah, we can read from the list, certainly. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of these many of us are familiar with, too. Is there anyone on council who desires to have a, you know, let's go through the actual two page summary that Paige prepared that's in your packet. Okay, seeing then what I'm gonna suggest then is that is Paige, if you could read the names and um, if you have any comments about any of these, any of these applicants, um, if we hear no comment, I'm gonna assume that that staff is recommending that the applicants meet our criteria and you know of no reason for us not to make this award. Uh, if you have anything from staff that's contrary to that, if you'd please note that as you read through the, the list. Okay, great. Um, the first one is a little drama. Um, the only comment I have um, about this one is they do meet all the requirements and there is no, um, we didn't put any um, restrictions as to how much each applicant is awarded. It's just up to 10,000. But I, I did want to point out um, the annual income for this business is 16,300. I thought that might be relevant um, when you're deciding how much you wanted to award. Do you have a um, recommendation on what you think might be appropriate for this size business? Um, considering that you know, the annual income is, is only 6,300 over what the max is. Um, I would think maybe $5,000 is, is a reasonable amount, um, but it, it's, it's entirely up to the council's discretion. I do have a question, Mayor. Councilman Donahue. Uh, so I think the majority of little drama is tied to the school. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other extenuating circumstance here is that clearly with school out, she doesn't have access to those kids to be putting on those programs. So this is a, another all things COVID situation for sure. Anyway. Do you have an opinion on, on uh, the amount based if you have knowledge about the actual entity on why, you know, if well, actually, and what's the total amount that we're giving? Up, we can give up to ten thousand dollars per applicant. Per, oh yeah. So I, I think I think Paige's um, suggestion is legit. You okay. know, so I'm certain. Yeah. 
Wait, I'm missing something there. Paige, aren't you recommending that we give like 15,000 to this one? No, up, it's up to 10, up to 10,000, Councilman Romack, is what we can give. That's what our policy is set at. Okay. Per, right. per Let entity. I'm sorry? Just want to be clear on that. Yeah, she's recommending that we go down to 5,000 on this particular entity because of its size. Okay. Okay, the next one. Um, barbell Fitness. Um, I do not have any um, comments about them. Um, the China Red Cafe, I don't have any comments about them. Um, GR Taylor Enterprises, um, no comments about them. Um, Litchfield Dental Care, no comments about them. Um, Rainy Walker Massage, um, I just want to point out that her the average monthly income for the two months of income provided was um, $9,000. So this is another um, smaller business, not quite as small as a little drama. Um, if you wanted to um, consider something less than the 10,000. Yeah, yeah, do you have a recommendation on this one based upon you know, your review of their financial uh, their financial records? I, I think for this one, um, seven thousand would be reasonable. Any comments from council? Okay, let's go on to the next one. Um, the next one is um, Society West which is a hair salon. Um, I have no comments about them. The next one is the Southwest Valley Chamber of Commerce. Um, they do meet all the requirements. Um, I did wanna point out that they don't have, they're a nonprofit, they're not physically located in Litchfield Park. They are located in Goodyear, but based on their um, narrative, they are very active in the community. And the next one is J&M Salons or Supercuts in the Litchfield Marketplace. Um, I don't have any comments about them. The next one is Teeny Town Playland. Um, my comments about them is based on their size, I would recommend um, 8,000 for them. Um, the next one is the West Valley Mavericks Foundation, another nonprofit. I don't have any comments about them. And that's it. Have a. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Councilman Claire. Just a question on, um, on two of the applicants, one on the West Valley Mavericks. We do, I know we do, um, charity donations once a year, this seems to be a second bite at that with them being a nonprofit. And, and this, this seems to be different than what we're talking about, especially a, a different entity than the, the chamber. And then the other one that I really that was a questioning, I had a, a question in regards to what type of work it is, is the GNR Taylor. It just says they've had a lack of business, but doesn't really state what the business is. Roofing there are roofing business? I can answer that. There's a roofing contractor. Okay. Thank you. He lives on Wigwam. The, uh, this is a little bit different situation than our annual uh, appropriations. Normally, the, the Mavericks would not qualify probably to even request an appropriation because their, their revenues are significantly higher in a normal year than, than this, the type of entity that we would even consider, I think, appropriating out of our, out of our budget of, I don't know, $15,000 or so. <clears throat> this year is different because of COVID that it has essentially shut down, <clears throat> shut down all of the Mavericks fundraising uh, events. 
And so they are, you know, their revenue situation is, is significantly less than what it would normally be. And so their, their ability to function, you know, in the community has been greatly diminished. So it's a different, it's a different situation. Thank you. Question? Yes, Council, I'm sorry, Vice, Vice Mayor Faith. Well, thank you. The, what are the purpose of these grants? I, I thought they were uh, part of the money kind of given to us to kind of promote jobs and to keep people working. Um, they're, supposed, they're supposed to mitigate some of the impacts, the revenue impacts from COVID, from the shutdowns and those sorts of things on um, our local organizations, so business and nonprofit organizations. So the Chamber and the Mavericks, you think, qualify in this or? It's, you know, I, I would say that it's, you know, it's, the Chamber may, may be less than the Mavericks, but the Mavericks, you know, maybe not either, but it, it depends on whether a nonprofit uh, qualifies. And then are we gonna look at nonprofits that actually have significant number of employees where they're having trouble paying those employees? So the, uh, this money, if it goes to the Mavericks, will, will simply be going out to other charitable organizations as part of their annual gift, gift giving. Uh, and I'm sure they'll still be doing some gift giving this year, but it'll be a lot less than what they normally give out in a, in a, in a year. So it will benefit people at groups like Homeless Youth Organization, Homeless Youth Connection and things like that, the food bank. Um, so it, it won't go to employee salaries, I don't think. I mean, they've got, they, they have one employee, which is an executive director. In the case of the, in case of the chamber, the chamber will probably use it for their operating, operating expenses since their, their budget, you know, their, their budget really is, it is what it is. And I don't, whether it will benefit anybody within the city of Litchfield Park, you know, it's harder to know if there's a business that may benefit from the chamber. That, that that benefit would come from this allocation of $10,000 to the chamber itself. So for different reasons, each of them could be questioned. Mayor? Let's see, I'm not sure who, who asked first. I saw the first person I saw was Councilman Donahue. Uh, my question about those two entities is, are they also applying to other cities? Goodyear, Avondale, for some of those, we, we don't know that, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if they're applying or not applying. Uh, I can tell you in the case of Goodyear, Goodyear took uh, all of their money and they've just kept it. They haven't allocated it to anything, you know, in the community. And, I, and it's, uh, you know, I think it's a significant amount of money that they got because they're roughly 10 times our size. Yeah. So they probably got 10 times as much money. Um, so how much, how much did, did we end up getting? So this was a 300,000. So they probably got 3 million. And it, and, but I don't think they've used it you know, for any grants to anyone. And I don't know what Avondale's done. Are there rules about how it's used? No. Oh, wow. No, there, are no, there actually aren't. No, we could keep it entirely in the city just to, to cover our extra expenses ca caused by COVID. Mm -hmm. um, or whatever. I mean, literally, there is no requirement that we do anything with it. Some cities are, you know, are making grants like this. Um, I think maybe Glendale's doing something that's similar. But is this and is this just a one-time application? Correct. So this there will one, not be. Yeah. We we allocated half of the, half of the money that we got. We allocated into this program, and we we set the initial qualifications and did not have any applicants, at least anyone who qualified. So we modified the applic the applic you know, the criteria slightly and put it out again. And now we've got 11 applicants, okay. which if we award it, we'll use, you know, slightly less than half of the funds that we got. Mayor? Mr. City Manager. So keep in mind, half is actually $360,000 Council asked to have half of the three hundred and sixty thousand dollars be made available as soon as possible. That's what we're doing tonight with the one hundred and eighty thousand potentially available. There is another one hundred and eighty thousand dollars available for another round. 
of this sort of thing coming up in the future. Right. And after the first or time. or not. I mean, we could or choose to, we could choose to keep it and spend it on something for the residents. I mean, it, correct. It and and also, how we spend it because address, addressing the vice mayor's. Just one second. Technically, the this money technically came to us from the state for use in paying our cost of police and fire. So the money that we got from the state, 360,000 we got for the state is allocated, all of it, 100% of it's allocated to the cost of police and fire. What that did then is free up $360,000 of our normal budget. And so that's why there's no requirement on how we spend it. The thought was that cities would spend it in ways that would support things like these organizations. That was the concept, but it was not a requirement. So now Mr. City Manager, go ahead and finish your. Yes, sir. The final comment I had was that regarding uh, Vice Mayor Faith's uh, comment about helping keep people gainfully employed. There was another program called the uh, PPP or paycheck program and that paycheck program allocated different funds to employers so that they could actually then keep people gainfully employed and pay their paychecks. And that's, um, that's administered through the county. It's actually administered through the SBA, the SBA, not the county. The SBA and private banks. But in any event, we have this pot of $180,000, $10,000 a pop and we've got 11 applicants in it. We don't have to award it. If we, if the council decides that it doesn't want to award any of it, we don't have to award any of it. We could decide not to make these uh, awards tonight, or we could decide that some of them, you know, we don't want to do nonprofits. And if we decide that we don't want to do nonprofits, then we have two of our 11 are nonprofit entities that you know, they're both a little bit different from our business entities, but they both would still qualify they qualify generally under the program that we adopted. Councilman right. Clifford, did you have your hand up? Yes, sir. I just said, addressing the question on the Southwest Valley Chamber as the city's rep there, I'm not aware of any other uh, city applications they've put in. There was a, a state for Chambers of Commerce, which there'd be a very small amount of money that could be granted, or I think they've actually been granted that. Um, but it's 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 less than what we're offering is my my recollection. So, but no, no, nothing from Avondale, nothing from Goodyear, for the Southwest Valley Chamber. Okay, any any other comments from Council, Mr. Mayor? Councilman Romack. Thank you. Um, going back to uh, the Mavericks, uh, you're you're well aware of this operation. Um, Randy Blazek had a really nice article. <laughs> in the West Valley View this week, uh, talking about the Mavericks and what some of the things they do. And then there was another article in there. They do a shop with a cop and they'll take some underprivileged kids and take them to uh, various, I, I'm gonna say Kohl's or something like that, maybe it's pennies and they, uh, with the police officers and they help these kids to get some Christmas gifts or, or various things that they wouldn't, wouldn't normally do. You know, the Mavericks are such a local group here uh, of young men on the west side. And it's, I personally, I think, I don't know how we can invest any better than to help support an operation like that. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, I think your comments are, are spot on. They, they, do a, they do actually a couple of programs like, like that. Uh, one is shopping with the cop. Another one that is based um, in uh, both in, in, in our community and, and also in a community in the Northwest is at the start of the school year, they, they receive um, recommendations from places like Homeless Youth Connection, um, different groups that serve kids that are in, in significant need and they, they take them to, to uh, Kohl's and they, the kids have roughly $100 per child uh, which ends up oftentimes being augmented out of the pockets of the Mavericks individually who were at the event. And the kids buy clothes and they buy school supplies and things that they need just, you know, that, that they would otherwise not have. So there, there's a there's hundred examples of things that Mavericks do in the community that are very beneficial. 
And the, the money, if, if we allocate money to the Mavericks, what will happen is it will flow through into those kind of programs. It won't be used for uh, expenses of, of you know, any of their of any of their activities or expenses for any of their employees. So, Councilman McClare. I, I think we should go ahead and make a motion then to uh, approve these allocations with the exceptions of uh, the changes that Paige made in her presentation to the three groups. So 5,000 to a little, a little drama, correct? Correct. 7,000 to, uh, is it Rainy Walk, Walker? Correct. 7,000 to uh, Teeny Time? Yes, sir. Okay. Is there a, is there a second for a motion for the motion? A second. Uh, second by Council Donahue. Is there any further discussion by Council? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, Council Rostosi. I have a conflict of interest with one of the um, entities on the list, so I'll just rec recuse myself from the vote. Okay. Any other discussion from any Council member? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Councilman Brainerd Watson, did you or are you going to chat vote? We're going to take that as a yes from Councilman Brainerd Watson. Uh, Sorry, so I'm having trouble with my computer. Yes, I'm an I. Okay, thank you. So then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And I don't remember what it is. Let's look. Next item on the agenda is a farewell to the city manager. So members of the council are offered an opportunity to say farewell, bon voyage to Count. To City Manager Stevens, would anyone like to speak? Yeah, I will. Okay, Councilman Romack. Good, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Bill, it was it was truly my honor and privilege to be on the search committee that uh, helped bring you to Litchfield Park. I was um, excited about having you here, and I uh, I like to think of you as a confidant and a friend. Um, and we're uh, I'm sorry that you're going. I understand that Nora has uh, probably has some influence on this and figures that you need to stay home with her. So with that, I wish you all the best. And again, thank you for uh, being a part of our little community. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Donahue. And I will say also adding Nora to this group that you guys are gonna love retirement. Pretty sure that you're gonna find plenty to do and um, on behalf of me and my family, please tell Nora as well, ciao, and we hope that you'll return for something and enjoy. And what do you, what do you call somebody who enjoys Mondays? Retired. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments from council? Well, I wanna say, I wanna say uh, that we, we, we definitely will miss you uh, Bill, uh, you came to us at a, at a very difficult time in, in the city's um, history. We had lost our city manager that was very close to many of us. And we had waited for a period of time just to allow that scar to heal a little bit before we tried to bring in a new city manager and, and put him down in a spot where the comparisons would be um, too fresh for that city manager probably to have much chance of success. So you've, you came in and you've done a very good job through a very difficult period of time. Uh, we had significant staff turnover that was not related to anything that you did. Uh, we had some staff that, you know, quite frankly, we are better that they left than if they had stayed. And you managed through that process. Uh, you were able to replace staff either from outside, sort, outside new, new people such as uh, Paige Peterson, uh, or through internal promotions of employees that we had that we were able to challenge to do more, and they have done a good job. So you have managed the city very well through a very difficult time from an employee standpoint, 
And then uh, obviously the team that you built has, has done a great job through the difficulties of keeping the city operating effectively during COVID. So those are, those are both great accomplishments. And I want to congratulate you on them and tell you that those are the, those, those things clearly we're going to miss. And our, our next city manager is going to have, uh, there, there certainly are different shoes than what Daryl left, but they're also very large shoes to fill because you've done a very good job at managing the, the staff of people that work for us. Uh, I'm going to leave the, leave, I'm going to end my comments though with, with my shock and at what occurred at the, uh, at the employee meeting that and where the employees purchased you a gift. Uh, it was, I think, very special that they, that they dipped into their own pockets and came up with a very, something that was very special to you. So uh, while the city gave you a plaque that I'm sure is, is quite <laughs> a, a quite important part of your life in the future and that you'll find an appropriate drawer for it where it will sit for the rest of its life, uh, the employees got together and purchased for the, uh, the city manager they, a Fender electric guitar. And it is a, it is a um, I guess, a new reproduction of what the original Fender electric guitar was like that started the rock band revolution in uh, the United States. And frankly, I was shocked when I found what the gift was because I thought, well, what is he going to do with, with a Fender guitar? I, I mean, I could understand maybe if you bought him a, you know, a, a, a regular, you know, guitar that he would learn how to play guitar and, and um, you know, it'd be like, I don't know, sing ballads to Nora or something. But then as we got into it, I found out that actually he is, he has a second life that I don't remember he ever disclosed to us when we were considering hiring him. He actually is a rock star. He sings in a rock band. And it has been his goal to be able to learn how to play the electric guitar so that he doesn't have to postpone singing if he can't find someone to play guitar. So he's limited now because since he doesn't play guitar, he doesn't feel comfortable just going out to karaoke bars. So he needs a guitar player with him so, he can, so that he can sing. And so if he can't find a guitar player, the way you solve that problem, particularly if you're a retired colonel from the Air Force, is you just learn how to play guitar. And so that's what he's doing is he's learning how to play guitar. And he was, he was, uh, he, he actually further shocked me after that, after this uh, employee luncheon, when he was explaining to me that he was a singer, because I wasn't sure exactly what part he played in this, uh, in this rock band. I thought, maybe, well, maybe he was a, he's the guitarist. And so this Fender guitar is going to make it easy because now he can really, can really wail out some tunes. But then I found out that he was the singer. And the way that I found out is that he has a video of, of himself singing. So he played the video, but he wouldn't show me the video. I just got to listen to it. So I reportedly, based upon my listening, he actually is a pretty good singer in this rock band. It was actually shocking, but I can't guarantee that it was really him singing because he would not show me the picture of the video. So I don't, I don't what know. What was he wearing? Why, what was he wearing when he was singing? I, yeah, I had all those questions, but I didn't get them answered because he, he hid his phone up against his chest but he allowed me to listen to it. So I didn't want to violate his privacy and rip it out of his hands. So I don't know what he was wearing. But I'm just hopeful that as he learns to play the guitar, that he'll be able to do two things at one time. So you have to play the guitar and sing. It's, you know, it may be difficult. So it was, uh, it was quite special. And I know, I know on a serious note that he was very touched by the gift and I can, you know, I can understand why. So, we're gonna. I, I'm gonna miss having you. You know, having you be our city manager. You, you've done a good job, and it. it uh, for me as mayor, it, it. It is always good to have a competent city manager, so that you don't have to worry every day about what's happening down at the city. So with that, you know, good luck in retirement. Uh, I hope you and Nora are very, very happy, and that you find plenty to do to to uh, keep yourselves busy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, I'm going to make a quick comment too. 
<laughs> that big smile Bill's got on his face here. It's a <laughs> retirement thing. Uh, a lot of us old guys have, have, you know, dreamed about that, but it has never happened yet. Right, Tom? Uh, I don't know about <laughs> dream or nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I first met Bill at the Arizona League of Cities and Towns Conference in Tucson. We were at a seminar put on by the National League of Cities and Towns, which we subsequently joined with the pipe program that, that, that we're involved with. And I was quite impressed you know, uh, in the seminar with some of the questions and the comments, and it was kind of some open forum kind of events, you know, listening to Bill. And uh, so I spoke with him afterwards and he'd heard about the Litchfield job opening, but I made sure he didn't leave the seminar or leave the League of Cities and Towns Conference without an application in his hand. <laughs> so it's worked out, you know, quite well. I appreciate you, you being here, Bill, you've done a great job. Uh, you, you, everything I was expecting from, from you, know, you know, what I saw down there. I appreciate that. Thanks for sneaking up behind me and getting me that application. <laughs> Councilman McClure, did you have your hand up? I did. I just wanted to thank Bill. When I, uh, when I got into this about a year ago after the appointment, um, I had a lot of questions and was thrown into the fire pretty fast. And uh, Bill was gracious enough to sit me in his office a couple of different times and and kind of give me the, the outline of the do's and the don'ts. And uh, he's been a good resource for me as, I, as uh, the time I've been here and, and just very much thank him for everything he's done. Thank you. Can I chime in? Absolutely. I just, I just would thank Bill as well, because when I started, he was, and, and even up to today, he's always available by phone to answer any question, no matter how stupid it may end up being. And he's so patient with you. And, and he's just been a wonderful asset and a, a good friend. And he and Nora both are just you know, two wonderful, caring, uh, kind people with, with beautiful souls and gonna so be very solely missed here in Litchfield. Thank you very much. Okay. I wonder if he was wearing a wig. I bet he had well, long hair. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't get to see, but it would be it would be a sight if he had long hair. I think that'd be kind of cool. Maybe the old Alice Cooper look. That's right. <laughs> so so what does he sing? Rock and roll, blues, what? Well, rock and roll. Country Western, bluegrass. Yeah, do you still have that song you can play for us? A don't show it to us, but play it. A little everything, actually. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it. You know right where it is. I do. You got it. <laughs> you got to get to it first. Bill, I think you should share your screen. <laughs> There's no video. That's it. It's just a sound bite. All right. I'll play a little bit of it. I don't want to belabor the meeting. Okay, that's enough. So, we'll, be, we'll be hitting the bars in Marana trying to find you now, huh? Thank you. <laughs> I, if I get calls from the police down in Southern Arizona, I'm going to tell them I don't even know you. <laughs> that's all right. You won't recognize me. I'll have long hair. Yeah. All right, we're going to go on to our next, our next item of business, which is appointment of an interim city manager. Uh, as you know, we've had discussions with uh, Matthew Williams, our current assistant city manager at uh, serve as an interim city manager. Uh, we have provided you with a contract to, you know, to do that. 
the uh, the contract differential in salary or for uh, assuming extra responsibilities of the interim position of $12 on an annual basis. Um, we have agreed with uh, Mr. Williams that in the event that we decide as a council not to uh, retain him on a permanent basis as city manager that he will be, uh, we would welcome him going back to his former position of assistant city manager. And if he does go back to that position, then the, the $20,000 difference in salary will, will, um, will stop. So he'll go back to the, he'll go back to his former position uh, at the salary of that position with any colas that may have happened in the interim period when he's, when he's working as the city manager. So he would, he would be held harmless for, uh, you know, for taking this position for whatever time that we decide to have him in the interim position. Uh, it would be the, it would be the intent, it would at least be my intention that we would be looking over the next, you know, several weeks to several months at, uh, at his performance and making a decision on whether we, whether it is in the city's best interest to negotiate a contract with him as the permanent city manager, or should we open it up and go out and see what's available uh, by doing a job, you know, by doing a city manager search for which he would be uh, welcome to apply. So uh, with that, I think you have the contracts, the contract in your packet. Uh, is there any discussion before we go to a motion? Motion, self-moved, approved. So okay. motion, is to, motion is to approve him for, as an interim city manager uh, and to execute, authorize the mayor to execute the contract on behalf of the city that's been presented in your packet. Yes. Is there a second? Yes. Yes, Councilman Romack seconds? Yes. Okay. Now, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, congratulations, you, Mr. Now Mr. Williams. Okay. Uh, you are now our interim city manager. And you have, Thanks. you have about, I don't know, 10 days or so that you may be able to suck some knowledge out of Bill Stevens before he leaves. Do all I can. Okay. I'll teach him how to sing. And that would be helpful. Hard, yeah, that'd be wonderful. Hard job. And I, I, th I think as your as one of your as one of your first assignments that you need to need to accomplish over this next you know between now and the first of January, is to put together a revised organization chart, to demonstrate how the different responsibilities are going to be dealt with, um, with Bill being gone and you taking over that spot. Obviously, there's there's a hole in the organization, so. We're going to need to know how you're going to how you're going to deal with that. Okay, uh, next item of business is the rec center perimeter wall and building exterior finish. No, no do we have? It says we have that we're going to have Richard Alvarado here. Is that the case, or Mr. Williams? Are you going to present this, or you or Sonny? Uh, yes, sir. I, I am here. Oh, Mayor. Richard's here. I'm yes, sorry, sir. Richard. I didn't see your I didn't see your box. Um, so first off, um, if I could, um, Bill, congratulations. Uh, wish you the best uh, moving forward in your retirement, and um, appreciate the uh, guidance and leadership you have given um, in my time here, <laughs> in in moving in the public works director position. You're welcome, Richard. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you, sir. And to Matthew, um, congratulations on your interim position as well. I know you'll do a great Richard. job there. Uh, with that being said, we'll move into the uh, Recreation uh, Center, the restucco and repainting project uh, that we have. Um, so this is part of the FY21 CIP. Uh, it, it has been a budgeted project. And um, with this, the perimeter wall to the rec center there is in need of some repair uh, from stucco, uh, peeling off paint, peeling off cracks um, that surrounds that pool area. Uh, so what our, our staff has done is we reached out to Gaster Painting and Coatings, uh, who is a Mojave um, vendor through the Mojave Cooperative um, and requested a proposal to re-stucco and repaint 
the perimeter wall. And included in that would be um, wrapping all the way back around on the south, west, and the north side of the wreck and carry into the small storage and um, uh, waste management uh, dump area there. Um, so in, in, in with that, you'll see in your packet, it's option A, and th this uh, proposal is for the uh, amount of $21,338.11. And uh, in, it includes quite a bit as far as, you know, prepping um, the entire surface, uh, doing multiple coats, uh, multiple coats, excuse me, of the stucco sand finish, as well as a conditioner and sealer um, to that wall. The color will be selected um, with the intention to match the existing uh, color of the rec center. Um, and in moving forward with that, we've also asked uh, Gaster uh, Paintings and Coating to put in a um, an option to repaint, which you'll see is an option B as well in this uh, proposal to paint the entire rec center um, where the preschool is, the front of the um, exterior of the rec center building there, which um, would be an option. And that would include um, all the exterior, uh, the wood, the metal uh, portions of the stairway in the back. Um, located in the back where the pool um, area is. And um, the entry planters in front of the recreation center building as well. So with that, <clears throat> the uh, option B um, would be $11,250. Okay, and with option A and B total, uh, it would be $32,588.11 for Gaster uh, to do option A and B. And um, if approved, uh, this, this project would begin in January of 2021. And it would be completed before the resealing, which was previously, previously approved by council and the repainting of the pool deck, which is going to take place in February of 2021. Um, with this um, redoing of the stucco and the painting, our public works department um, in working together or with, the, with, the, with the scheduling of the painting, our department will be responsible for uh, the landscape cutback um, surrounding the perimeter wall there. And uh, we'll be removing some of the damaged orange trees and um, the wrought iron fencing that is in, um, it's, it's in bad shape right now with rust. It's no longer um, usable. It's, it's pretty much left, um, met its uh, uh, lifespan there. So with all that, um, our staff anticipates spending uh, 5,000 for the landscaping portion, that would include uh, removal of all materials of all plants, as well as um, updating the irrigation and replanting ar uh, around the, um, the wall in front of the rec center there. Um, with this moving forward, staff again recommends uh, the approval uh, from council um, for the cooperative purchasing contract with uh, Gaster Painting and Coatings uh, for the restucco and painting of the external pool area wall. Uh, but again, leaves option B to the council's discretion uh, regarding the painting of the rec center um, building as well as the preschool building attached to it. Um, again, this, is, this, this project is budgeted in the uh, CIP uh, budget um, for the FY 20, 2021. And um, it's originally budgeted 60,000 in there. 
and if approved um, with options A, B together, uh, this would not exceed uh, 40,000. So we are uh, well under the uh, original budget of 60,000 for this CIP project. And uh, with that, I'll leave it uh, to council. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Questions from the council, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, I, I have two. Um, maybe we have too much information in our packets, but I look all this stuff that came from Mojave on their sample stuff, Riddle was lowest and Gaster was the third lowest. Did we just go to Gaster? Did we bid this? How, how did we pick Gaster? Uh, with picking Gaster, I did um, look onto the Mojave for uh, different vendors and Gaster um, was one of basically the first that I pulled up and looked at the website and um, kind of looked over some of the projects that they've done and then uh, requested uh, for Gasser to come out and give us a bid on so the this was, uh, restock this was sole, sole sourced and there was no bidding and the lowest two bidders on the Mojave contract didn't get a chance at it? No, they, um, these, these other vendors on there who you were referring to, they, um, they have already gone through the extensive bidding process um, just to get on Mojave. Um, so with us uh, using Mojave, it just gives us, I guess, a um, more of a selection, you could say, for different vendors. Um, I, 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 I want to say without going through the bid process of, of getting uh, three or more bids using the Mojave Cooperative. I thought the Mojave the Cooperative allowed us to not go through all the publication and all the waiting times and stuff and gave us names of people that had bid this that are on their list that have already gone through the vetting process. So we could, there's four names that were submitted in here. Um, and Gaster was not the recommended and lowest, I guess, in this process they went through. So I'm trying to figure out how we got to Gaster. Uh, with Ga I have asked the other two to bid. With Gaster, I just, um, again, I just went straight to Gaster after reviewing uh, the Mojave vendor list. Um, no particular reason, uh, just ask Gaster to come out and give a proposal on the uh, the work needed. I got, a, I got a second question. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. The product that was selected is sounds like it's to go through there, patch the bad stucco, sand wash it, put the f-stop on it, and paint it. Did, did we look into putting a synthetic stucco product over this instead with the paint? The, the color already in it? No, uh, no, we did not. We looked at matching the existing um, uh, the existing finish to the uh, rec center that you would see out in the uh, front, the entryway to the rec to match. Uh, we did not look into putting uh, colored stucco uh, into, into that application. Normally, the colored stucco is a little more durable. That's why it was. Is, is Romack, did we lose John Romack in the meeting here? I don't see him on the list here. He did about 10 minutes ago. You won? Okay. Left about 10 minutes ago. <clears throat> okay. I mean, the synthetic stucco is typically a better product. And if we're going to go ahead and restucco all the walls, it would seem like it, it would be. We should look into at least maybe if there's some loose stuck on some bad stucco patches, get that blended in, and then maybe look at putting a better product over it instead of paint. Um, in the in this quote, they would be restuccoing the inside 
of that perimeter wall as well as the outside. Uh, they would be removing, um, removing and scraping all the existing um, kind of stucco that's on the outside of that perimeter wall as well as yeah. the inside. Yeah, they're gonna power wash and scrape everything loose off. Yes, sir. Yes. And they would seal, they would seal everything, um, all cracks. Um, they would put that top coat above, which is uh, not there currently on the top of the wall to help um, block any moisture, um, you know, with the outer elements and help to prevent any, um, you know, painting, um, you know, bubbling due to just moisture. Top coat on top of the wall? Yeah, they're going to be putting the, um, let me get to it here. Synthetic stucco. <laughs> okay. Where are we at? Yeah, they're going to be putting a uh, waterproofing up on the horizontal surface uh, top of that wall there. So, Mr. Vice Mayor, the the um, the Mojave bids. It looks like there were that there were four contractors and four sample jobs, and this particular contractor was was low on one of the four, and then another contractor was low on one of the four, and then another contractor was low on two of the four. But the differentials, um, you know, it. There's nothing about Gaster's pricing as you look in, in across the other across the other prices that you know in one case he's ten percent low in the other case he's I don't know he might be more than that high so there may be something about the sample jobs that you know that his cost structure is not quite as competitive on that particular type of job but his bids are you know they're not way out of line with with the other people on this list and it, and I don't. No, I don't know from what I can see on Mojave whether these samples really are anything like what we're having done or not. So it's hard to tell whether they're indicative that there might be a lower cost person out there. This issue of synthetic synthetic um, plaster or, or stucco stucco was it seems like we just we discussed that when we looked at the city hall restuccoing. What did we end up doing on that? Do you remember? No, we had the same conversation about whether it would be, you know, longer, it would last longer, and we would put a stucco on that had a color that was in the stucco. Yeah, I mean, that's the way most synthetic stucco is. It's not very thick typically, but it's there's two kinds of synthetic stucco. One's almost like epoxy, and the other one's kind of like a heavy, heavy rubber paint. And um, they got the color in them. Yeah. I don't know if it's you know if, if we need if it's worth going back and and re, you know looking at that as an alternative and redoing it. When does I, this I believe, Mr. Mayor, I believe um, with the synthetic stucco, um, I believe it would increase the pricing as well. Obviously, due to um, you know Vice Mayor's comments, it may be a better uh, coating. I'm wondering if we have a time constraint on this or not, Richard. Uh, Yes, sir. Um, you know, with with the you know with what we have, and had the vendor come out and take a look at it, and the coordinating with the um, uh, the deck, the repainting of the deck there. So all of it, it is in kind of like a time time restraint, as well as uh, you know just getting everything on schedule. Not to saying we'd have to rush by any means. We obviously want to look at um, all aspects of this and all the details, but. Um, Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, I mean, we, I think we've been supportive of the idea of doing this project. The only question is whether we want to take the time to look at this other, this other alternative process. Mr. Vice Mayor, you know more about it than maybe anybody else is sitting here, I assume. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with this. That's why I was hoping John was still online. Yeah. I mean, 
I'm looking at the breakdown of the costs. I mean, you power wash, you're going to have no matter what. Uh, you've got $12,000 to sand finish. You've got uh, 2700 bucks for the F-stop. Another 2700 bucks for the paint. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer whether you know what the cost would be, and whether it'd be. A, I know it'd be a better product, but I don't know what the cost would be. The question is whether you, whether you want to have this postponed and have that research done, or if we take a look at this, or if we're going to consider and, and award this bid the way it is. Uh, I can I can tell you that it really needs to be done. I. Our, that we have that we've we've invested a lot of money in the wreck and various features down there really look good i mean they've done a great job and the, the wreck looks so much better than it did years ago but if you walk around the wreck you you know it's pretty quickly you realize that it needs to be painted there needs to be some stucco work done on the wall so it, it's a very important project that i want to see it happen you know in the near term so it's but i'm, I'm i would be happy if you want to postpone the decision long enough to look at the alternative. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Clare, Councilman Clare. So that we don't, it sounds like there's a time constraint with the February project. Is it possible to get this approved with the opportunity to get a, chain, a cost of a change order just to see what that cost would be and we could address it in January? Uh, I don't know, Richard, um, is, I don't know, does this, uh, Gaston, do that, do that other process or not? Yeah, I, I, I think um, we could definitely contact Gaster and see if we can uh, modify this proposal and in looking into um, that stucco finish. Um, we do have it. We, we did communicate with them about the whole repainting of the deck and um, you know, possibly scheduling at the beginning of January, if approved, just to kind of be ahead of schedule. So if you'd like, right. yes, sir, we could, we could definitely look into it. So you want to approve it, Mayor, with a not to exceed? If, if yeah, well, what, I, what I, I would think the way to do this would be is, would be to approve the, uh, these two option A and B tonight with direction to staff to look into, the, to um, doing a change order to, to change to a synthetic uh, stucco and to bring that back, and we'll we'll come back if necessary in a special in a special meeting, a special Zoom meeting to look at that one issue if necessary. Well, maybe we give Matthew and Richard the alternative to either just go this way if they think there's something better, come back to us. If not, right. If not, they don't have to come back to us. Correct. That's what I would think. Okay. All right, so, so just want to falls off in a year. So gonna, you know, yeah, so Councilman so. Claire, you want to make a motion to approve uh, the perimeter wall and the building exterior, okay. exterior finish options A and B under item F with direction to staff to, to look into this other uh, process. And, and if they think it's that, you know, if they think there's advent, you know, that the cost benefit analysis is the other process would be better to bring this back to council and we'll look at it. In a, in a special work in a special meeting i do do i need to restate all that or can we go with what you said i think you can say i move what you said I move terry, what you figure, terry roth will figure it out <laughs> all right is there a second second by councilman donahue any further discussion all those in favor please say aye 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 any opposed Okay, motion carries. Next item is uh, an action to refer to the Planning and Zoning Commission, the issue of amending our, our city zoning code to regulate rec recreational marijuana as provided in ARS Title 36, Chapter 28.2. Uh, is there a motion to make this referral? So moved. Moved by Councilman Ostosi. Is there a second, Councilman Donahue? Is there any further discussion on this on making the referral to our PNZ? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it's referred. Um, we're going to adjourn, but before we adjourn, um, 
Matthew, I'd like to have you uh, you schedule for us a work study between now and and the next regular meeting, and it could be it could be to do the a work study just like we did this time. So it would be a six o'clock meeting prior to our regular meeting, and the topics of the work study will be the city manager job description, which we have in our packets, and the uh, the the description of the ideal city manager that, that's in the package, in the packet. And then if there are any, if anyone in the council wants to add any, anything specific to the work study, if you would get that to me in the next, uh, I don't know, 10 days or so, two weeks, so that we have time to get it worked into uh, the description of the topics to be done at, at this work study meeting. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So I'm moved. Seconded by Councilman Clare. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you for a long meeting. Thanks, guys. Have a Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yeah. Brian Faith and Brian Gold with congratulations. Thank you. Merry Christmas to all of you. Happy New Year. So is Brian <laughs> Colbreth related to Sonny Colbreth? His yeah. son. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. His son. <laughs> is Sonny's son? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Good night. Yeah. No nepotism it's here. See young people. <laughs> Bring these young people up to take our spot at some point, you know? The wonderful <laughs> thing about Litchfield Park is it's all is all our kids are coming back here to live. So. Yeah. yeah. Good thing. All good. Okay. Bye, guys. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye, guys.